welcome all, you all, everyone uh, to the 100th meeting of the um, Advisory Council. So we're really excited about this, this sort of, uh, um, uh, in some ways, anniversary or, or at least a, a notable meeting that we have here in terms of, of numbers. Um, I will uh, jump into the, uh, the director's uh, overview in just a second, but I just wanted to say a few words of introduction really quickly because, um, as you've noticed since the last time you all were here and as we've discussed um, on calls uh, subsequently, uh, you know, there have been a few changes in the leadership. Um, and so I just wanted to say before we, before we jump in uh, a few words about that. So, um, you know, I guess I would say, despite um, you know the, you know, we really valued Anne's leadership for the Nursing Institute, and um, obviously we were sad to see her go, but for good reasons, um, for family reasons. Um, but um, that said, I'm really, really honored to be here and and to serve in this temporary acting role here for the the Nursing Institute. Um, recognize that there's been a little bit of change. Over, over the last you know, few months in particular, but over the last year or so. Um, and, and we know that that can be challenging, but uh, our staff here at the Nursing Institute have really risen to the occasion. Um, and you know, I want to emphasize that uh, all these changes, however challenging, underscore the NIH leadership, so Dr. Collins, Dr. Tabak, um, they're really strong support of an interest in uh, this institute and, 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 and its success going forward. So my goal over the next few months is and, and remains to sort of uh, uh, consider, um, you know, the, the scientific direction of the Institute and keep it on the same kind of course that it has been on. But of course, um, you know, being open to and embracing uh, and leveraging scientific opportunities when they present themselves, because uh, we don't want to miss something uh, just because we're in a, a transitional time. Um, and also to sort of address some of our um, challenges with the management of the institute, things that you know every organization faces, uh, just in terms of I think they're updating and um, you know be able to leverage some of my connections across NIH and the office of the director, and also my experience in scientific administration. So. You know, with, with all that change, though, I, I'm really optimistic because I think it creates an opportunity, um, or at least a potential for great opportunity. Um, and I'm really excited about the opportunities that abound for NINR in the future. And so um, I just wanted to say I've really enjoyed, uh, not that this is ending, but I guess this kind of sounds like this is ending. It's actually quite the opposite at the beginning. But um, I really enjoyed working with the staff and, and starting to get to know all of you all, uh, and will continue to do so over the next few months. So um, with that said, um, I'm going to jump into some logistics for the day before we, we switch to the, the director's overview. So um, first, there, the theme for today, we kind of have a theme for this council, and it is all about uh, training. Um, and we've invited uh, a few uh, special guests here today. So we have um, uh, Dr. Deb Troutman from AACN, who is here to give us an update and, and provide some data uh, that they have on training. And then we have a panel um, and some presentations from some trainees at various levels in the career to talk about their personal experience um, uh, as trainee. And, um, and then we will have a presentation from our staff here who help uh, do analyses and who help run the, the training portfolio, who kind of provide some information on what NINR is doing and um, has done and what we're <laughs> considering for the future. And obviously, with all of this, would love your feedback. That's, that's kind of why, that's why you're here. Um, and, and then we have a concept after lunch that we will uh, we'll present to you so, um, for your concurrence. So, just a reminder that closed session will begin at 9 a.m. tomorrow. Um, and uh, just one absence to note, uh, Dr. Sheila Sullivan is unable to attend today's open session, but will be in attendance tomorrow for the closed session. So we're glad that she'll be able to make it. Um, and I just want to take a moment to, to welcome our new council members. Um, a familiar face who was here ad hoc last time, but um, Dr. Un Oak M. 
uh, who is a senior associate dean for research and innovation and professor in Edith Folsom Honeycutt Endowed Chair at Emory, uh, the Neil Hodgson Woodruff School of Nursing. Um, and, and Dr. M has gained national and international recognition as a methodologist, researcher, and theorist in uh, international cross-cultural women's health through more than 380 papers, abstracts, and chapters. Um, and her most outstanding contribution to nursing uh, so far has, has been a research program that adopts computer and mobile technologies to um, eliminate genomic and ethnic disparities. So she has really taken the lead in this new emerging field, and her current studies are among the first of their kind to use these technologies to build nursing knowledge. So. We, I, I won't go through her many, many, many <laughs> um, awards and accolades here. Um, and you know, we're just excited about her participation on the council and look forward to working with her for more in the future. So uh, we're really grateful for you to be here today. Um, and, and I'll mention this uh, a little bit uh, later in the, in the slide set, but I do want to say before I jump in, um, introduce someone who's sitting to my right and also to my left, <laughs> the two people, um, one who's a familiar face, uh, Dr. Jessica Gill, who is um, who has been in our intramural program for several years and is a, a distinguished scientist there, and she is now serving in the acting deputy director role at the Institute. Um, and then Dr. Kathleen Anderson, who is... Um, who is serving as the acting director of the Division of Extramural Science Programs and the acting executive secretary of the council today. So just uh, for some background on her, she is responsible for leading, managing, and coordinating all of our scientific programs at, at the institute. Um, and obviously, everything that fits with grants management, review, council activities, et cetera. So she is on what is called a detail to an INR. So um, it's essentially. NIMH, which is her home institution, National Institute of uh, Mental Health, has kind of loaned her to us. <laughs> They've been very generous, and we're very excited to have her here. But uh, just, just a word about her background. Her uh, permanent position over at NIMH is the Deputy Director of the Division of Translational Research. Um, and she at NIMH supports programs of research and training that translate knowledge from basic science to discover the ideology, pathophysiology, and trajectory of mental health disorders, and then the development of effective interventions for children and adults. So she is a very distinguished and experienced NIH program director and administrator, and we are very grateful to have her here, and she joined NINR. Um, at, in early December. So uh, just, just a word of introduction about who I'm about to turn this over to to talk about some council procedures and everything else. Um, but before I do, I just want to take a moment to, to thank Yvonne Bryan, who had been serving in this role um, and is now, we've, I think we finally got her down to only doing one job. <laughs> so, which I, I hope she's been excited about um, maybe uh, you know, having some uh, some bandwidth to be able to to help me out uh, more with with some activities and projects that we have going on um, in the office of the director. So uh, at NINR. So um, thank you to Yvonne for for all of her help with DESP and her continued role um, working even more closely with me. So with that, I will turn it over to Kathy to go over the procedures. Thank you, Tara. Um, I want to thank Yvonne as well, as she's essential in sort of my learn by learn by fire hose and orienting me particularly to how council works and the role of the executive secretary. Um, and thanks to everybody else at NINR who's been really, really very warm and generous with their time. Um, so I just have right now. I just have a few reminders for you. First is that. This meeting um, is being recorded, and it's being done for the purpose of creating our minutes, and then it will be destroyed. Um, I just want to remind you to use your microphones. Make sure you turn them on when you speak, and then turn them off, because we can only have two on at the same time. Please, yes. Uh, and then public portions of this meeting are being videocast live and will be archived on the NIH website. Um, they will also be uploaded to the council playlist on NANR's YouTube channel. 
Um, I am asked to remind you that as a special government employee, council members may not engage in any lobbying activities while receiving pay from the federal government. Um, tomorrow I will give more specific instructions about conflict of interest and confidentiality at the beginning of the closed session, um, but I wanted to encourage you to review the complete conference conflict of interest and confidentiality statements that are found in the day one open session PDF um, of your of the materials that were uploaded for you. Um, I encourage you to review it for tomorrow. I have one bit of business I need to conduct before I turn it back over to Tara. Um, I hope you had an opportunity to review the meeting minutes from September Council. They were also um, in uploaded to the electronic council book and in the open session PDF. So unless anybody has anything they want to discuss about those, I was going to ask for a motion to approve. I need a motion. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, can I get a second motion? Second. Anyone opposed? Okay, the motion carries. Thank you. We just have a um, little bit of time to go over some of the exciting um, uh, updates that have um, occurred both at uh, oh. HHS and NIH, and, and to discuss with you guys some uh, updates from NIR, NINR and talk about some of the scientific advances that have uh, you know, kind of advanced over the, the last few months. So at HHS, there's been uh, a change. Dr. Stephen Hahn was sworn in as the, the, direct, uh, the commissioner of the U.S. Food and Drug uh, Administration, so the FDA. And he, he has previously been the chief, executive, chief medical executive at MD Anderson, and he is a radiation oncologist by training. Um, and so he was sworn in, I believe, sometime in November um, and has been uh, starting to probably get his feet wet with, with everything at the FDA. Um, and what that has meant for NIH more broadly is that uh, Dr. Ned Sharpless, who um, was appointed as the director of the National Cancer Institute uh, a couple years ago. He had moved over, he had been asked by the administration to move over and serve as the acting commissioner of the FDA, FDA after um, Dr. Scott Gottlieb uh, left. And so he had moved over there and been in that role for six or seven months. And now, uh, to NIH's good fortune, we get him back. So he is uh, back again serving as the director of the National Cancer Institute. And some other changes that have occurred across, uh, across the NIH have been that we selected an associate director for data science, um, Dr. Susan Gregoric. So this is uh, an area, obviously, I think that is uh, massively important to every field of research right now, just because you know, the volumes of data that we are generating it just keeps growing exponentially. Um, and so Susan was selected for the ads role, um, and she's also the director of the Office of Data Science Strategy, which is located within the NIH Office of the Director. Um, before assuming this role uh, earlier this year, uh, last year, I guess, um, she was a, a division director at our, the National Institute of General Medical Sciences and has uh, previously, I think, spent some time in the um, Department of Energy. So we're excited that Susan has kind of officially stepped into this role. We also uh, selected uh, a chief executive officer for the All of Us program, um, Dr. Josh Denny. So the All of Us program, as um, I'm sure you are all familiar with, is this uh, large signature program that we have um, within the Office of the Director that is a um, you know, precision medicine initiative, essentially, that is building a cohort of a million or more people um, with very diverse backgrounds um, to, to look at uh, the intersection of genetics and environment um, and, and other factors. Uh, and Josh, Denny uh, actually comes from my old stomping grounds at uh, Vanderbilt University Medical Center, uh, where he was a professor in the Department of Biomedical Informatics and Medicine. So we're excited about Josh's arrival here shortly. And um, one note, too, that Eric Dishman, who has been serving as the CEO of all of this program since 
truly its inception as the All of Us program. Um, he is uh, transferring to a new role as Chief Innovation Officer. So we still get to keep Eric around and, and value his input um, and expertise. Well, we also wanted to give you an, uh, a note about another, another change that has happened uh, across NIH, um, which in some ways have <laughs> impacted this institute um, through chains of reactions. Um, but Dr. Martha Summerman, who was the, the director of the National Institute of uh, Dental and Craniofacial Disorders uh, uh, Research, has, um, has retired. And um, because of some uh, changes in their leadership and not having a, a permanent deputy director, Sound familiar? Um, Dr. Tabeck has been asked to move over and, and serve as the acting NIDCR director, which is a familiar role for him because he served as the director of this institute for 10 years before becoming the principal deputy director of NIH. So um, hence, you know, the changes that we had here. So it's been, it's been an interesting ride, <laughs> ride over the last couple of months and something that um, we had not necessarily anticipated. Uh, happening. So, um, but you know, uh, we're 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 glad that that Martha is now uh, sort of transitioned into semi-retirement mode. She still has her lab here at NIH, so she's she's still an active scientist. So, one other thing that that has. Um, Kind of been brewing across NIH is that um, we partnered with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, to launch a new collaboration. And this is looking primarily at um, HIV and sickle cell disease to look at some gene-based strategies that, um, that can be uh, implemented. And, and the goal is really to develop affordable gene-based cures for sickle cell and HIV um, with the intention that these cures uh, are to be made globally available, um, including and especially in low-resource settings. So um, I'm interested to see how this kind of plays out and, and what um, potential for uh, NINR's role is in this effort as well. Um, and, and something else that has been sort of brewing across NIH and, and the broader, I think, um, you know, scientific community and even, I think, into our, our society as, uh, as a whole uh, is this issue of, uh, of anti-harassment. And so <clears throat> specifically, NIH uh, convened, or Dr. Collins convened a working group of his advisory committee to the director or the ACD um, to, to take a look at uh, and put together some recommendations on changing the culture um, around uh, harassment and specifically sexual harassment. And so at the December ACD meeting, they reported out their recommendations, which uh, Dr. Collins accepted. And these focus on a variety of different things, um, including having uh, NIH develop a means of direct reporting developing some really specific agency SOPs, um, managing professional misconduct, and sort of treating it uh, very similarly to how we treat research misconduct. Um, and there's a whole host of recommendations. So if you're, you're interested, I encourage you to, to check out the report, um, which is on the ACD website. That was an interesting meeting that December because we had lots of stuff going on um, across NIH that was being reported out. And one of the other things um, was on artificial intelligence. So there was an AI working group that also released its final report. Um, and it, it was focused on recommendations that collectively address the need for investment in data, ethics, and, and people. So, around training the right people, getting the, the people who have, who are multilingual, um, as they call it, so people who can, you know, talk to, uh, you know, biomedical researchers who are engineers or coders, and they can kind of speak multiple languages. Um, and their recommendations uh, kind of focused on criteria for, for machine learning and, and mach machine learning friendly data sets, so developing them, publishing them, distributing them. Um, as well as consent and data access standards, ethical principles, curricula, and and then as I mentioned, you know, making sure that that we have the the pool of uh, of researchers for the future, so trainees and fellows. I'm 
a little bit closer to home here at the at NINR. Um, we'll we'll go through some of the staffing changes that have uh, that have occurred. Um, I already mentioned a couple, but um, I'll, I'll mention them again in a second. Um, and I think the one that probably maybe is of most interest to you all is um, an update on the NINR director search. So. Just as a reminder, if we didn't hammer home the deadline to you guys hard enough, uh, the applications closed November 18th, um, so late last year, and uh, there's been an initial review of applicant qualifications that has gone on, and they are currently conducting interviews. So I'm hopeful that before the next meeting of council, we will have an announcement about our selection. So, um, so stay tuned, I guess, uh, for that one. But in the interim, um, I, I'm serving as, uh, and I'm delighted to be serving as the NINR uh, acting director and um, have been since January 1. So all of exactly two weeks. <laughs> um, and at the same time, uh, I asked uh, Jessica Gill, as I mentioned, to, to serve as the uh, acting deputy director of the Institute. So, um, so we, are, we are delving in. Uh, head first and <laughs> trying to to continue to get our, our hands around all of the issues um, related to the in Institute, all the amazing science that's being funded, um, and, and many other things. Um, and one of the other things that, that we did is, as I, as I said before, um, and have introduced Kathy, is, is we brought on an acting director of our Division of Extramural Science Programs, or DESP, and um, Kathy has been serving in this role since early December, um, and we're really grateful to her for, for taking on this, this role and, and bringing a, a wealth of experience uh, to the Institute. And we also are announcing uh, and welcoming uh, Dr. Terry Armstrong to serve as our Acting Scientific Director um, of our Division of Intramural Research, which will be effective February 3rd. So she's coming over to NINR on detail, so sort of similar uh, mechanism that we brought Kathy over. Um, but she's coming on detail from the National Cancer Institute. And her, her role over there is the Deputy Chief of the neuro-oncology branch, um, and that's within the Center for Cancer Research. So she's a, a cl trained clinician and scientist, and her primary area of research encompasses the investigation of interventions that reduce symptom burden on brain tumor patients. And so she has interacted quite a bit with um, our intramural program um, in terms of collaborating with the Symptom Science Center and, and other things. So we're, we're really grateful to Terry for, for agreeing to, to come over um, and spend some time with NINR, and I think she's got um, great experience, experience um, and, and expertise that will really help uh, to continue to strengthen our intramural program, especially while uh, you know, Jessica is serving in her new role um, and we've also, uh, as of um, I think Monday, next Monday, he will start officially, um, Mr. Aaron Condon, who is currently our Chief AO, um, Administrative Officer. Um, he has been selected to be our Deputy Executive Officer. So I'm sure Anna is thrilled to have some additional support and help. Um, and he has a broad range of experience um, uh, in sort of uh, organizational, managerial, programmatic uh, matters that span the institute and in helping us with all of our administrative functions. Um, and he actually started at uh, at NINR last, not last, in 2018, December of 2018. Um, and so he's been here for a little while. Um, so he's he's familiar with the institute and previously has spent time at uh, the National Cancer Institute and within the Office of the Director. At NIH. So some, so we're we're excited to welcome all, all the the new people to NINR. But we also want to acknowledge some staff that are existing staff that have done some amazing things. Um, and so uh, Dr. Michelle Hamlet and Augie Diana have been uh, uh, recognized for their contributions to the Heal Initiative at the NINDS Directors Award Ceremony. So they have kind of 
you know, gone above and beyond uh, their normal roles and have helped really helped represent NINR on this 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 very large initiative that we have at NIH. Um, and as a reminder, I'll, I'll mention it in a second. But the Heal initiative is the Heal um, helping to end helping to end addiction long term initiative. This is an opioid initiative that we, we started at NIH. Um, so congratulations to Augie and Michelle for for this honor. Um, and, and Augie's on here again, but <laughs> unfortunately for us, not in a not in a way that we would we would like. But you know, for him, I think it's a, a it's a good transition. But um, we have a, we've had a few retirements and departures over the last uh, several months since we we last met. Um, so Arthur Meltzer, who um, was the the chief of the science implementation branch within uh, Dispol has uh, retired at the end of December, um, and he has been with NINR since 2010. So we congratulate Arthur for his retirement, and again, we'll, we'll miss him here as well. And, and then Augie also retired around the same time, and Augie was a program director who oversaw our um, SBIR, STTR um, program. And it's not all bad news with Augie. We have managed to convince him to, to stick around with us for a little while, or maybe it's just that he couldn't stay away. But um, he, he, is, uh, he retired, I think, December 31st and came back January 6th uh, part-time with us, uh, you know, as we, we sort of uh, work through uh, the, uh, the hiring um, and backfilling his position. So um, he is, he's around for another few months at least. Um, and then uh, Dr. Nara Gavini, who, as I think you all know, was the executive secretary of the council, but also served as the chief of the Office of Extramural Programs. Uh, he, he got a new job in November and is now the executive director of research at Massachusetts General Hospital's Institute of Health Professionals. So he is now uh, a little bit closer to his family. And I think, uh, unfortunately for us, uh, you know, he, he, he left. But I think it's a, it's a good move for him for, for many reasons. And so um, we want to thank Arthur, Augie, and Nara for all their contributions to NINR and, of course, wish them the best. And, of course, we'll still keep bugging Augie because he hasn't officially cut ties with us just yet. Um, so news from across NINR. So just some activities that have been going on besides our staff changes. Um, we had a, a couple directors lectures. So I think this one was the first one was associated with this the last council meeting that we had back in September, and, and Dr. Dean McSweeney presented. Um, on uh, her, pro her program of research that focuses on symptoms of heart disease in women. Um, and uh, Dr. Patricia Stone in mm -hmm. November, uh, I believe, presented her research that aims to enhance quality of care for older adults. So those lectures, I think, can be viewed uh, at the link below if anyone was unable to, um, to view them. And they're also on our YouTube channel, which was mentioned earlier. So just a few other little notes about some of the, the things that NINR has been participating in. Um, you may be familiar with the Sound Health Initiative. <laughs> you know, the funny thing is my, there's something about my voice that sets off Siri all the time. <laughs> so I shouldn't, shouldn't be surprised by that. Well, clearly Siri is very interested in our collaboration with the Sound Health Initiative. Um, so we'll elaborate on that a little more. <laughs> so this program is um, a, a partnership that NIH has with the Kennedy Center and the National Endowments for the Arts. Um, and it's been it's been ongoing since uh, 2017, and it, it's it's exploring the relationship between the brain and music, um, and something that Dr. Collins actually is very very engaged with. But um, as part of this initiative, NINR has a funded study of an active music engagement intervention for young children with acute uh, lymphoblastic leukemia. Um, and it also includes their parents. So it, it explores the potential of music for treating a wide range of conditions resulting from neurological and other disorders. So we're um, interested to see how this, this study plays out because they're looking at changes in stress and immune function biomarkers. So it could be some really interesting data that will come out of that. 
And along with some other big initiatives, I mentioned the HeLa initiative previously, uh, I just want to um, uh, emphasize that uh, NINR is involved with this effort again, and um, we have uh, been really uh, delighted that we were awarded um, a couple of supplements to help support some of our, our researchers and, and to expand some of the NINR supported studies that we have ongoing. So the, the first one that we'll mention is the one that's looking at the impact of music therapy in cancer survivors with chronic pain. And uh, it's, it's to look at uh, the impact of interactive music therapy on daily opioid use and chronic pain in cancer survivors who are chronic opioid users. And then another one that we uh, are supporting and have expanded our research on is, is looking at differences in pain intensity uh, wound microbiome and, and patient wound factors between opioid tolerant and non opioid tolerant individuals. So these are all really important studies that we are really glad that we can expand on and, and capitalize on some of the, the research efforts that we have ongoing here at NINR. And Dr. Jessica Gill is back again. Um, she is part of a consortium that is looking at the impact of brain injuries on military personnel. So this is a, a $50 million uh, effort that's looking at the long-term impacts of mild traumatic brain injuries or concussions on service members and veterans. And it's kind of very, a very nice acronym. It's called the LIMBIC study. So the Long-Term Impact of Military Relevant Brain Injury Consortium. Um, and it launched in October uh, of last year and will continue for five years. So, um, and she is partnering with the Uniformed Services University of the Health Sciences, which is across the street, um, some direction, <laughs> and Walter Reed Naval Center uh, to lead this effort uh, looking at uh, biomarkers of concussions. And within our extramural community, we wanted to promote something that one of our, our grantees has uh, been involved with. And, in early December of last year, Dr. Sarah uh, San Santon, uh, who is the director of the Hopkins Center to Promote Resilience in Persons and Families Living with Multiple Chronic Conditions. This is the PROMOTE Center, um, which is an NINR Center of Excellence. Um, she joined panelists live on Politico to discuss the topic of combating chronic conditions. So. Um, the, the panel discussed policy strategies and in, in, uh, innovations that can improve primary care treatment for patients with chronic conditions. So uh, very ex exciting to see some of the interesting um, uh, work uh, and the different ways that the, our grantees are promoting uh, their, their efforts and their knowledge. So a few other little scientific advances that we want to make sure uh, we highlight to you all because these are really exciting to us. Um, the first, which is a topic that I think is um, definitely of interest to um, the department and to the NIH leadership more broadly, but obviously very important to, to NINR, um, is one that um, Dr. Susan Carmichael from UCSF and her colleagues, colleagues have, have, um, have conducted the research on. Um, and so they published uh, uh, last year on a study w that looked at um, severe maternal morbidity among stillbirths and, and live birth deliveries uh, in the state of California. And they found that women who have stillbirths have a fourfold higher risk of severe maternal morbidity, um, which is obviously um, something that, you know, is very, um, very concerning. So it was a very interesting study that, that they found some, some really um, some interesting results from that. Hopefully, we can you know start tackling a way to to address these morbidities, um, not to mention the mortalities. We also uh, want to mention a NINR funded study uh, on HIV AIDS that uh, was looking at um, antiretroviral therapy and adherence among unstably housed Black men who have sex with men in the United States and. They, they found, um, I think somewhat unexpectedly, at least for me as I was reading through this, that um, black men who have sex with men um, who self-reported homelessness were actually more likely to have been tested for HIV than their housed counterparts. Um, but uh, somewhat unsurprisingly, they had more difficulty adhering to their antiretroviral therapy. So um, it just provides some information about how uh, 
you know, campaigns and other um, efforts can be designed uh, to prevent HIV spread uh, within high-risk populations. And uh, I think this is yeah, our last advance that we want to promote, but this is in, you know, an area that obviously is of great importance to the Nursing Institute, and that is on end-of-life and palliative care. Um, two studies that, uh, that came out last year uh, looking at disparities in hospice utilization for older cancer patients living in the Deep South, and they found that hospice utilization differed by patients and hospital characteristics. So, um, you know, those that were, um, well, it just illuminated some ways that the research could focus on um, improving hospital utilization um, in, in older parents and the, in the older patients in the Deep South. So then they found some, uh, then another study found some racial uh, differences in healthcare transitions and hospice use at the end of life. Um, and they found some very uh, big variations between races that exist in end of life and palliative care uh, transitions and, and hospice use patterns. So um, what they found was that African American patients incurred the highest number of transitions while Hispanic and Asian patients were likely to die without receiving any services or to die in a hospital, um, suggesting that they might uh, use hospital services at the very end of life. So this will help us uh, sort of uh, improve how, how we um, address quality of life, uh, uh, quality of end of life care um, across uh, different populations. So. Uh, one thing that we just want to mention, we want to highlight some of our NINR funding opportunities that are currently out on the street, as we say. Um, so I'm not going to go through all of these here, but um, and I encourage you to check out uh, the link on our website that has our funding opportunities uh, listed for, um, for those. And you know, NINR also frequently partners with ICs across NIH. And, um, we have done so here to support research endeavors across our traditional boundaries. So there are a few examples that are listed here of um, some efforts that are ongoing. And again, encourage you to, pub uh, to check out the NIH uh, guide for more information on these efforts. So more uh, in-house in, in kind of efforts, we have the, the um, Summer Genetics Institute, the SGI, and it's celebrating its 20th anniversary, which we're very excited about. So the application deadline is March 1st, so anyone who's interested in, mark your calendars. Um, and the, the, the session itself is happening in June, um, from June 1st to June 26th um, on the NIH campus. Um, and as a reminder, this is a tuition-free, one-month intensive program of classroom classroom and laboratory instruction in genetics that provides a foundation for biobehavioral research and clinical practice. So um, to date, we've had 430 SGI graduates making a difference in communities across the country. So um, we're really uh, excited about this anniversary symposium that we have as well. And the symptom methodologies boot camp that we have this year is focused on artificial intelligence. So please save the date for that, which is um, going to be held August 3rd through 6th, um, also on the NIH campus. Um, and the, the boot camp, you know, as, as I think most of you know, is held each summer and features lectures by nationally and internationally uh, recognized scientists from NIH and universities across the country. Um, and uh, some other uh, statistics to note, I guess, for this one is that we've had, uh, as of 2019, we've had 950 students, faculty, and clinicians attend the methodology boot camps. So we en encourage folks to, to continue to take advantage of this resource that we offer. Um, and registration will open on April 1st. So uh, please pass this information on to anyone that you think will be interested in attending. We also have uh, some rotations that are that are being developed and that are being offered in the Symptom Science Center. So um, 
we, uh, we are promoting these rotations um, through NINR, intramural labs, um, and the symptom science, symptom science in our clinic uh, to uh, help, uh, help promote and achieve the established objectives of the symptom science center. Um, and so rotation participants kind of have uh, multiple different tracks that they can work through, sort of a dual track thing. So those who are interested in learning how to incorporate uh, patient reported outcomes uh, or performance testing and phenotyping uh, symptoms can rotate through the clinic. And those who are wanting to learn um, specific assays to measure biomarkers, gene expression, or other uh, molecular methods would then rotate through the laboratories. So, um, you know, we're, we're very excited to, to offer this, this new uh, training uh, opportunity. And just, just to build on that a little bit, the, the NIH Symptom Science Center uh, uh, training deliverables as its, its goals are uh, to train, uh, training tailored to user needs using a uh, modular curriculum, access to and training in clinical questionnaires and tools standardized collection of common data elements, and to learn about integrating clinical uh, research with the lab. So um, through these collaborations <laughs> and expanding mentorship, uh, assessment of symptoms can be standardized as we kind of try to lead the, uh, the effort as symptom science experts here at NINR. And last but definitely not least, we have a few council members who are rotating off the council uh, after this meeting today, and I just want to acknowledge those uh, folks who are listed here and thank them for their service on the advisory council. So Dr. Catherine Bowles, um, Dr. Jeff Kelly, uh, Dr. Deborah Cognac-Griffin, and Dr. Rita Pickler for, and again, so we thank you for your service on this advisory council, and, um, you know, we also uh, acknowledge that because of uh, some need for extension of your, your service. You're extending a little bit longer than maybe you had anticipated, but we're very grateful for that. Um, and uh, we're also um, looking forward to the arrival of our new council members, hopefully hopefully at the next council meeting. So, um, and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll celebrate more this evening. So, uh, so thank you all for your service uh, on, on this council. So I would just... Really appreciate your, your service to the Institute. Um, and then just one quick reminder uh, for the latest on anything related to NANR, please check out our website um, and you can subscribe to our e-delivery service, uh, markup delivery service, um, for information right to your inbox. So don't even have to go to the website, um, but we definitely encourage you to do so. Um, so uh, we have been um, very, very fortunate here at NINR and NIH to uh, receive a, uh, a funding increase for FY19 and um, appreciate Congress's uh, efforts to, to continue to provide us with these, these increases that we can leverage to support the best um, nursing research. And I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. John Grayson and, and Kevin Wilson um, for uh, some more information on some of our budget and legislative activities. So. Good morning, everyone. My name is Kevin Wilson. I'm the budget officer at NINR. Um, first, I'd like to give you a quick overview of the federal budget process, very quick, and then we'll move into uh, some budget facts and figures and things like that. Um, around the summertime, we start formulating our budgets and prepare them for submission to OMB. Um, for the 2020 budget, that process began in the summer of 2018. Um, the deadline to turn them into OMB was in early fall. Um, OMB receives our budget submissions and then um, either provides and in recommends increases or decreases and comments and things like that that we have to respond to. 
Um, when they return that budget to us, that's known as the pass back. That occurs usually around Thanksgiving. Um, we have an opportunity at that point to appeal and um, either uh, ask for more money for certain programs or address the concerns that OMB had. That appeal process, uh, when it's completed, so OMB sometimes uh, goes along with our request, sometimes they don't, depends on each year. Um, once that happens, OMB rolls all the budgets from all the agencies together in one president's budget, and the president submits them to Congress. That usually happens around uh, February, uh, specifically the first Monday in February at the State of the Union. Usually, sometimes they are delayed for one reason or another. Um, once the president submits the budget to Congress, Congress um, creates and votes a on a budget resolution, which sets our overall spending levels across the government. Um, at that point, um, each chamber of Congress has about a dozen subcommittees, and the subcommittees represent um, their respective agencies that they oversee. Um, they hold hearings where the agencies can defend their budgets, and uh, they ask questions about the budgets to help them recommend um, how to put the appropriation bills together. Um, they can either accept the president's budget as it is, as long as it remains within the confines <coughs> of the budget resolution, or they can uh, recommend their own budget, or they can modify the president's budget. Um, once they vote on those respective bills, um, the bills are go to the House floor or the Senate floor for a an overall uh, vote in Congress. And once those pass, we have a an, um, um, a budget bill from each side that they can conference on. Um, conferencing basically is the Senate and House meet to resolve differences. Um, work out details and come up with a final budget bill. And uh, that bill is sent back to each chamber where they vote on it. And uh, once that's approved, the bill is sent to the president and he either signs it into law or vetoes it. And then once it's signed into law, of course, we have an appropriation. Um, which leads us to the, the nitty gritty of our slides here today. Um, our recent appropriations in history, this is a three-year uh, budget slide. It shows the FY18 omnibus, which is a, a government-wide package of appropriations bills all lumped into one bill. And FY19, we received a 5.2% increase the year that, that year. That was pretty nice. And then in FY19, we received another nice increase of 3.1% in a minibus bill. And minibus is basically a few appropriations bills from certain agencies lumped into one large bill. There could be several of those passed in that year. And then this year, we also received a minibus recently signed in uh, a few weeks ago by the president into law for another 3.8 percent increase. So we're very happy to receive that. Um, if you notice, the NIH increases are a little higher. That's because they include money for uh, the cures initiatives and uh, the heal initiatives um, and, and things like that. Um, if we move on to the next slide, this slide is uh, specific about what happened for 2020. Um, the president initially recommended about a 14% decrease um, across NINR and about a 2% increase overall. Uh, most of the special initiatives, funding like the cures and things like that, weren't, weren't cut very much, so that decrease was quite a bit less. Um, the House and Senate recommended about uh, 5 to 6 percent increases. Um, those were really nice. We were hoping we could get something like that. And we still receive, wind up receiving a 3.8 percent increase that Congress signed into law recently. And we're very happy to receive that. Um, this slide depicts our funding levels over the past uh, 30 years. Um, the blue line represents actual funding in, in actual dollars, and the red line shows what those dollars would look like with measured in FY19 dollars. And uh, as you can see that uh, we've lost a little bit of purchasing power um, in about the last 15 years or so, 
and it should, this slide definitely reflects the effects of inflation on our budget. Um, the last slide, um, I'm going to show you what happened in FY19, how we spent our money. About two-thirds of our budget went to RPGs. Um, that's basically been typical for the, since I've been here at NINR. Um, our intramural programs, a little over 8%. Um, training or NRSAs is 4.5%, which we're still about the second highest at NIH. We are the second highest percent of total increase in training at NIH, and uh, that will be discussed later. Um, only second to uh, NIGMS. Um, the other research includes career grants. That's another big part of our training po portfolio. And then centers receives about 3.5% as well. Um, the R&D portion up there, um, that's mostly TAPS, um, including program evaluation, which is the biggest chunk of that. Um, RMS is research management and support. That Those are basically administrative services and salaries for extramural staff and administrative sa staff. Um, it includes rent and assessments and things like that as well. Basically, it's overhead for the institute. And with that, I'll pass it off to John for the legislative update. So thanks, Kevin. This will be very brief. I just wanted to highlight a couple of items for you um, of, uh, of interest to NINR on the congressional front. So as you probably know, in any given congressional session, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of bills that are introduced, many of, some of which are related to NIH, some of which even mention NINR. Most of those bills don't go anywhere. Um, but this one actually did, and so I thought I'd mention it today, and this is the Palliative Care and Hospice Education and Training Act, or PECHETA, because everything has to have an acronym. Uh, so this actually passed the House of Representatives on October 28th, uh, it, and it was then moved on to the Senate. Uh, there's also um, an identical bill that had been introduced in the Senate. And of note, uh, I believe the bill had um, several hundred uh, co-sponsors on a bipartisan basis in the House, which was very encouraging. And it has a, a good number of co-sponsors in the Senate as well. And much of the bill is focused on establishing programs to increase palliative care and hospice education and training to uh, increase the number of faculty in that area, but specifically of interest to NINR are provisions in the bill that call for an NIH strategy to intensify research on palliative care and hospice. Um, and it also requires NIH to uh, report on their activities in palliative care um, every three years or so as part of, the, of, a, of a larger NIH report. And so now we wait and see what happens in the Senate. Uh, they could pass it, they could change it and send it back, or they could do nothing. And um, time will tell. And the only other thing I wanted to quickly mention, um, and this actually dates back to last summer, um, we were very fortunate to host uh, two tours uh, related to Congress in our intramural program. Um, so the first was in June, uh, and this was a tour of, um, um, with the House Mental Health Caucus. These are staff from the House Mental Health Caucus, and they came around to a few labs at NIH, uh, including Dr. Gill's lab. And this is a terrible picture of that tour, but it's the only one we had. And so over there behind the drying rack and the water machine is Dr. Cashin giving them a... Uh, <laughs> Um, an introduction to the program, and then Dr. Gill uh, talked about her research in traumatic brain injury. And then a little, about a month later, um, we held a tour with uh, members of Congress. So this was the, uh, the House New Democrat Coalition, and there were four members and their staff who came around to visit NIH, and um, here they are talking with Dr. Gill about her work, and that was in the middle of July. And uh, that was a great tour. They asked a lot of fantastic questions. We were very impressed. They seemed very interested. So it's always a great opportunity for us to highlight um, what uh, all the exciting work that's going on in our intramural program. We're proud to do it. Um, and uh, hopefully there will be uh, more in the future. And I particularly wanted to acknowledge uh, Dr. Gill and her staff for being 
uh, willing and flexible enough to do these um, tours. I think this one, maybe we had a three or four day heads up and that was over a weekend. So, but it, it went off without a hitch and um, uh, a good time was had by all. So, um, that's all for me. Thanks, John. So, there, these tours, these are, I think, the, the first tours that we've had um, with congressional staff and members um, in the NINR uh, intramural program, and they're a great way to showcase what we do to the, the folks on the Hill um, and, uh, and build relationships and interactions with them. So it, it's, it's really great that we've had the opportunity to do so twice um, last year. Um, before we move on, are there any questions um, for, I guess, either me or John or Kevin about anything related to uh, budget or ledge issues or anything more generally? We'll, we'll make that an open question. Well, oh, I'm sorry. When you, you showed that the president recommended cuts of budget by about 13 percent, is that usual or unusual? Does that happen every year, or is that something that we should be concerned about? Um, the president every year recommends a budget. Um, it's based on what they campaign on, and they put forward their, their priorities. And then, but Congress has the power of the purse, basically. So it, it's common practice for a president to put forward a budget to match their policies that they campaign on. Some presidents rec request big increases. Some presidents, um, President Bush, for example, was because of the the climate at the time, pretty much kept with flat budgets over the year, and it was slight decreases or things like that. President Obama pretty much held the same measure, maybe some slight increases, and then we had, of course, the sequester year, which was a big decrease. Um, so it really depends on each year. Um, this current president has recommended um, spending reductions across the government. Um, that's been common with his, his priorities. Um, but as you know, every, when they're signed into law, the president has to put his mark on it too. So um, we're very happy to receive the increases we received. And there's a saying that we have around here that, that um, uh, what the president proposes and Congress disposes. So um, <laughs> that, that it is, a, as, as Kevin said, this common practice for the, the president to represent some of their, the administration's priorities. Um, and and um, at the end of the day, Congress takes that into consideration and has whatever they would like <laughs> to budget. So. Like well, we've been story. really grateful to have the increases that we've had. So, um. um, I'm sorry, were you finished? Yeah, okay. Um, so, at one point, the NINR budget for training was about six percent of the overall budget. So now it's four point five percent, and I'm I don't know what that means in dollars. So, can we have some maybe a little just uh, explanation of? you know, where we got from 6% to 4.5% and does it matter and is it more money or, you know, how does that really sort of translate out in the real world for those of us who are helping individuals get training grants? Yeah, so how about we hold that thought until later? Because we are, we're going we're gonna to have a whole presentation on that later. Okay. Yeah. yeah. John and, and David will, will discuss a lot more about some of the nuances even within that breakdown. So we can uh, we can discuss that a little bit later this afternoon. If you don't mind. Yeah. Please, please keep that question because we'll, yes. we'll make sure we circle back to it. All right. Uh, if nothing else, then uh, then I will. Am then thank you, John and Kevin. Um, so I am delighted to introduce our next speaker, um, Dr. Deb Troutman, uh, who is the president and chief executive officer of the American Association of Colleges of Nursing um, and has been since June of 2014. So she's formerly the executive director of the Center for Health Policy and Healthcare Transformation at Johns Hopkins Hospital um, and has held a variety of different clinical administrative leadership positions, including at University of Pittsburgh Medical Center and uh, Johns Hopkins. 
Um, she also served for the vice, as the Vice President of Patient Care Services for Howard County General Hospital and the Director of Nursing for Emergency Medicine at, at Johns Hopkins um, and has many, many different accolades. Um, and interestingly, one thing that her and I have talked about previously is her, her time. Um, she was a 2007-2008 uh, Robert Wood Johnson Health Policy Fellow and, and worked for the Honorable Nancy, Nancy Pelosi on uh, the Hill in the, in the House of Representatives. So she's had a, a wealth and a, a varied experience, um, and we are very grateful that she's coming to talk about some of the stuff that AAN, or AACN has done. Thanks, Deb. I'm trying to go green, so I have a little bit of paper, but mostly, excuse me, my iPad for a couple additions. Before I begin, I want to thank Tara, all of the NINR staff, and the council that is here. Your efforts, your work to assure that we have opportunities for nurse scientists to contribute is critically important. I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak with you briefly today. I'm going to share a little bit of data and also some of the work that AACN is doing with others, and hopefully that will help inform your discussion. We'll have time for some discussion after I conclude these brief PowerPoints, uh, but you can certainly ask something along the way. And then, again, I think this is ongoing conversation that is so important to many of us. So I thank you for the opportunity to be here. For those of you who don't know, many of you may, but the American Association of Colleges of Nursing is the voice for academic nursing. We represent 825 schools of nursing across the country. That representation includes five, over 500,000 students and over 40,000 faculty. About 19 to 20,000 of those faculty are full time. Clearly, opportunities for nurse scientists to make a difference, not just for the profession, but more importantly, for the health of the nation, is of top priority and concern to us. So as I figure out how to advance, am I just doing enter? <laughs> okay. Got it. I don't need that. Okay. I wanted to just share overall, though, the news with respect to nursing programs. Some of our other health professions are seeing a decline in an interest in their programs. Um, we have not experienced that in nursing. So overall, we continue to see a positive growth in interest in nursing programs, and I think, of course, that that is good for the country. As you can see, there's great growth in interest in the Doctor of Nursing Practice programs. Um, one of the important uh, points to make on this slide is that, um, and I'll speak to it a little bit more, but we were very concerned because we have been seeing a decline in interest in PhD programs, and we want to better understand why that's happening. It's too soon to celebrate, but this is a teeny bit of good news in that um, we are hopeful that many of our efforts collectively are going to reverse the declining trend. So let me come back to that in a moment, because you can see overall in the United States, we now have 135 PhD programs, four, doc four that also have Doctor of Nursing Science, four for EDD, and one PhD DMP. Now we're in the process of, we just finalized, a, or excuse me, we just finalized the survey. The response is coming back in. We're now looking at that data. So we'll have updated information. We do know that there are now four PhD DM, combined DMP programs. And this gives you the information about enrollments and graduations that's most current. What is troubling is that we are still turning away qualified applicants. And we are finding that similar to the reasons we're turning away um, interest, or excuse me, turning away candidates and other programs, it's similar in the PhD. And that is that we have um, a shortage of faculty. Uh, there are some that are beginning to uh, question the, their value for them, the return on investment in entering academia, and we absolutely think we must do more because there are so many opportunities, as you all know, in academia. And we also know, particularly with respect to um, you know, nurse scientists, that there are many other opportunities. But to have qualified candidates that they can't find a match either through faculty or where they want to study doesn't have the availability for them are the primary reasons uh, that we're seeing that occur. And we're working with our membership to see what we can do to reduce that. This shows you the growth in research-focused nursing programs. And again, well, that is important to see that um, 
I want to come back to that. That's the number of programs, rather, I'm sorry. But I want to speak to you specifically about this, the population, our student population. The good news, as you can see in this slide, is that we are seeing an increase in underrepresented groups. Um, however, we have seen a slight decline in the number of um, white PhD students, and we want to see an increase in all types of students. Uh, so I want to be clear, we also are seeing an, an improvement in our recruitment of males, and we, but that, as you can see by this graph, it still stayed fairly constant, though. And, and across all of our profession, not just for those who are interested in PhD programs, we know we must do more to increase opportunities for diversity within our student population. And we are having some great successes in many programs. This slide shows you the enrollment and graduations. And as you can see, our graduations are also steady with a slight increase. And then this one shows you sustaining PhD enrollments. So the, the point of concern here was that we did see this decline, and it was nearly a 10% decline. As I said, it's too soon to celebrate that less than 1% increase, uh, but we are very focused and want to do, as many of you in the room, as much as we can to understand it and uh, address and put in place actions that will help us minimize some of the challenges that either the schools or the students face. Many of you may be aware there was work done also by the National Academy of Medicine. A consensus study was done and published the results, a summary in 2018. And many of the findings for that study are very similar to what we are hearing from our communities that what is happening is, in some respects, a change in the understanding of potential students for what the value of pursuing PhD education could mean for them. There is, as this slide points out, a gulf between the number of qualified, excuse me, I can't speak today, sorry, a gulf between the number of qualified scientists and the opportunities that people think are possible. Many of those who were surveyed both in this study and through our, our communications with some of our membership and our member schools and the students, many believe that there's limited opportunity for them once they complete a program. And indeed, that's not true, but we need to do more, and I'll come to it, with respect to marketing and, and helping people understand where the different opportunities are. Some think that if they pursue a PhD, while some may have interest in being a bench scientist, some think that that, that is all the opportunity entails. And while being a bench scientist can be very rich and rewarding, there are, as you know, other opportunities. <laughs> There is also, with respect to return on investment, and I am unfortunately from a generation that I went to school, it took seven years for my PhD program, and I was fine with that. I would say that most of those who I talk to today, that is not acceptable. Uh, and there is um, an interest in being able to realize a return on investment. We've done much in many of our programs to create new and different ways to structure our curricula so that our graduates can graduate sooner and make a contribution earlier in their career. Mine, though, wasn't a fault of the program. I went very slowly on my journey because of all of my both work commitments and personal commitments. Um, however, again, I would say that there are less individuals that are interested in that type of a pathway. There's also, again, we need to do a better job providing career information. And if you haven't had yet an opportunity to go to AACN's website, I would encourage you to do so because what we've done there, we now have a quick link that is focused on PhD education. And as a part of that link, we can actually, you can tap on and you can listen to videos of current nurse scientists and hear about the contributions that they are making. And we have heard from many that for some who were unaware of what all the possibilities were, this is one way that has helped individuals gain a better understanding of what is possible. So I hope you would take a chance. And, and you can also see some of this, this data slides are available there as well. Uh, and then again, the, the prolonged uh, postdoc positions, lower salaries, inadequate training and mentorship. I know that you're going to hear from some scientists and, and some who are currently in the program a little bit later, and we have heard over and over again the value of strong mentorships uh, with both advisors as well as others within their cohort has helped make a very significant difference. 
I'm going to share a story about when I completed my PhD program, and actually after I had defended my dissertation, I was just extremely excited, very excited. And I was meeting a group of friends we were, and family. We were going to meet at a local restaurant to have a celebration. And I was so excited, I forgot the contact information. And I'll show a little bit of my age and the time, because you could dial a certain number on your phone, 411, and get the number. And since I was so anxious and so excited, my sister's driving the car. I dial 411, and this operator gets on, and I ask for the number of the person because I wanted to be sure they knew where we were meeting. The operator helped me, but this operator said to me, I just have to say, what's going on? You sound so excited. And I said, oh my gosh, I am. I said, I just defended my dissertation. I now have a PhD. My sister's driving the car. She said, I cannot believe you said that to a complete stranger. So I said, well, he's not. I had to ask him where he was from, and he was from Atlanta. But the point is that there is a lot of excitement about being able to achieve the educational success, the attainment of the degree. And what I realized was not so much just for me personally, which it was extraordinary. I think I celebrated for a year. But it's been my experience, perhaps with all of our education, but I would say most certainly with my PhD education, there is absolutely no way I could have gone on that journey alone. Not only the support from family and friends, uh, my educational colleagues, of course, and my faculty, but also even my colleagues at Hopkins. And, and so I learned as much about myself as I did about research during that process. So I like to share, and we all have our personal stories, but I like to share that I was happy to tell anyone about achieving that great milestone. And I would like us to be able to celebrate more um, for all of our colleagues who are, because also not, again, just about what we've achieved, but we will not realize better health and health care in this nation if we don't continue to maximize opportunities for all, but most importantly, nurse scientists to participate. So I have a little picture here. It's not a one-size-fits-all. It would be so easy if we could just say, if we do one, two, and three, that we would assure that we have a really strong pipeline. There are multiple strategies, and similar to that report from the National Academy of Medicine, then the IOM, we need to have recommendations for research in institutions, what can and should we think about doing differently for our curriculums and, and other um, opportunities within our institutions, recommendations for principal investigators, there are recommendations to NIH, and recommendations to policymakers. Now I'm going to try to see if I can pull up my other slide here. I'll pull it up for myself, but you're all not going to be able to see it. What AACN convened a, a group with the co-sponsoring with NINR, and we convened in August of 2018 and then produced a final report that we both reviewed in October of 2018. That report is available on AACN's website. There were four broad categories of recommendations of what we believe needs to be further um, activity and action, and that's obviously continuing the conversation. That small little uptick, is, while reason tiny celebration, we need to see and hope to see a much stronger level of interest in PhD programs. Enhancing our marketing and helping people again understand what those opportunities are. Identifying there are data gaps. There are places where we don't have good information that tells us what's creating some of these challenges. And then we do need to continue to think about who that community of stakeholders are that we engage that are larger than those of us who've already been participating in the conversations. Very specifically, out of that retreat came recommendations for students, and I'll just read you some of those. We need to identify those nurses who have a proclivity to research, we need to create strong peer connections and real mentoring experiences. We need to highlight the impact of nursing science. I was pleased to see Dr. Sarah Zanton's slide up there. I had worked with Sarah when I was at Hopkins. When I, you heard that I was a health policy fellow in the speaker's office. This was back in 2007, 2008. Sarah came to the speaker's office at that time with her research that was making a significant difference, but on a very small scale, for senior elderly Americans. 
And she began, I mean, in many ways, but part of that advocacy led to an opportunity then for more support for her that came from a variety of sources, but some of them, of course, government sources. And then now has led to support of Capable. It's a phenomenal program that we hope to see even get, as many of you know, more traction, where you're able to, one of, um, one of what her contributions was, one of many in that research, was taking and utilizing the services of handy in the homes of senior citizens, and by doing so, reduced the risk of falls and ultimately promoted a healthier and saving even saving money, but a healthier individual as well. So I was glad to see that. So we have to continue to highlight the impact, the difference that we can make, and then create opportunities for early exposure. Also for institutions, we need to help define the science of the future. We all have to contribute to that. We need to think about developing consortia between academic institutions to support science, but also, and many of us do this already, not just within our academic institutions, but what are we doing with our practice leaders and practice partners? Many nurse execs for health systems and hospitals have talked about the importance that having a nurse scientist on their staff has brought to, to their work and, more importantly, the care of their patients and their communities. And we also, with respect to the data gaps, I do not believe, despite the information that we have, that we yet fully understand all of the nuances of the challenges that we face. And we need to, AACN is currently conducting a survey, but we need to, uh, I mean, excuse me, we already conducted the survey and we're analyzing, putting together the findings. Uh, but we, we need to make sure that there's opportunities to go even deeper around some of these challenges that we face. And when we're looking to think about what are the breadth and depth of resources? We're pleased to see that the president's budget, and ultimately what was passed, rather, the support from Congress has shown an increase. Uh, but as the question was asked, and I know will be addressed later, uh, what is, how is that increase relative to what we need um, for, with respect to our programming? And are we aligning the resources that we have in a way that will help us achieve the best results? So I love this quote, it applies to so many things, but the difficulty lies so, so, and not so much in generating new ideas, but with escaping from the old ones. This is an economist, and as I think about that, I think we are doing more to attempt to escape from the old ones. For example, the programs, the curriculums moving, moving forward and being able to be more time efficient for, of resources for both the students and for time. Uh, but we also have some who still are clinging to the way it's always been, and we need to ask ourselves, where else could we change so that we could be more attractive to the, the student population coming in? So there are many activities at AACN. These are just a few of what is up on the horizon immediately. The end of this month, every January, the American Association of Colleges of Nursing hosts a doctoral conference, and we have one of the highest uh, numbers of attendees coming to this year's. We flip between Naples and um, California, so usually good weather as well, but I, extremely rich discussion and great presentations there. But we, a couple things in addition to oper talking about the challenges, is we really recognize the need to do more to highlight uh, some of the opportunities, some of the solutions that um, others have found within their own environment talking about, and you're going to do it here as well, what tomorrow's leaders are expecting, both um, those who will be conducting the research as well as the, the recipients of the benefits of that research. And then again, deep dive conversations. This is not as simple as we saw earlier, one size fits all. And so we'll also have a focus group. We also developed a PhD pipeline community. Uh, it's called AACN Connect, and there's a lot of activity conversation that's occurring there. Uh, to date, as you can see, 32 faculty have joined the discussion group, and there are over 25 posts. So we're just getting started. But the, as we all know, these online communities can, can be a valuable source of communication for us. I like Sisyphus, many of you remember. I first actually was reminded about Sisyphus beyond college when I started at Hopkins and I said to someone, why is it so hard to get something done? Um, that's what it seems like sometimes, you know, that you're pushing this rock up a hill just when you get there, you start to slide down again. I would challenge all of us that we have a lot of pushing yet to do. 
uh, I think that we're, we're making great strides in having an open conversation about what the challenges are, but I believe all of us as a community need to do more to support opportunities for those who have the potential to make a contribution in science. And then I'm a big fan of Abraham Lincoln as well, and Abraham Lincoln said the best way to predict the future is to create it. I hope we create a future where we value the importance of discovery for all nurses, but most importantly, we support as well a community of nurse scientists that's making a difference with other health professions to improve health, of course, the health care, but also how we learn, uh, improve the, the way we think about how we prepare qualified researchers for today and for tomorrow. So those conclude my very brief remarks. Pardon a few stumbles, I'm not sure why. I did have a full test coffee this morning. But um, maybe now if there are questions, comments, disagreements, um, and also anything that you'd like to share about what you all are doing or what you think is important. Hi. Hello, hi. And I know some familiar faces. We, we know each other, but yes, good to see you. Um, so, um, I'm sure you're aware that, um, that Native American nurse PhDs are under 25 in the country. Um, that's pretty abysmal uh, when we're almost a 7 million, million population. Yes. Um, so, we're, we're, we are those of us that are in leadership that are Native and through our center, we're, we are uh, looking at uh, what are the attractions and also the, the deterrence. And so one of the deterrents that has emerged is using the concept of pipeline. And so it might, oh. it might Say, be. So using the concept of pipeline, did yes. you? that's the first I've heard that. Thank you. Say some more, if you don't mind. Just that. Well, that, because of the Excel. Yes. And the whole. Got it. OK. Medical. So many yes. uh, folks don't even want to be associated with uh, any program that might have that. Uh, that concept attached to it, and so because in, you know, uh, of the connotation that that brings. Do you have a recommendation? I'd love to change it. We don't want, and, and this is a good point you've made. Words matter. Uh, words matter significantly when we're trying to uh, advance policy, when we're trying to explain a problem. It, were there any good ideas? We have started <laughs> using uh, pathways. Okay. Uh, journey. Uh, there are a few other. Okay. We can. Great. We could have further discussion. We have an advisory group, and I will take that back. That's a, really the first I've heard that, and I appreciate you sharing it, because we should not be erecting additional barriers if we can knowingly prevent that. That's a great point. I was just going to mention something that we, we have um, been using across NIH, and I think it's sort of trying to grow in frequency. Um, and I don't know if it's any better or not. John, you'll have to tell me. but. We, we um, like to say it's actually not a pipeline because it's not a straight path, but that people, um, that it actually constricts as people get further and further along the process and the pathway. And so it's more actually like a funnel shape than anything oh. else. So whatever way, I don't know if a funnel is better, but um, mm -hmm. it's a, a, at least a one one different way to think about it. Right. Well, and it's a very good point, too, because it isn't a pipeline per se. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Other comments or thoughts? Do you have the data on the uh, career pathways of the PhD graduates versus the MP graduates? Because uh, we are now seeing, uh, I mean, we are hiring the uh, DMP graduate as our faculty members, and we even begin to think about hiring them on our tenure track. So I think there may be some implications. Well, you raise a very good point. We, that's an area where we need better data understanding the uh, the outcomes, if you will, and, and where their career trajectories take them for both DNP and PhD. Uh, so that is a part of what we will need to do to enrich. There's some data, but we need to have richer data about that. Um, yep. 
one thing I've noticed um, in reading through some of the data that you all have um, and, and others is that the, the average age that folks enter into these programs is much, much higher than mm -hmm. folks um, who enter into other biomedical research yes. fields. And I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that, because that has, you know, sort of uh, ripple effects, you know, more broadly in terms of faculty, et cetera, um, and, and what, um, you know, on your experience has been uh, discussed and implemented in terms of trying to encourage people to join these programs earlier. Yes. But thank you. Yes, that is true that we have seen that um, we're much older uh, population that's entering. And then um, despite how wonderful we all may be, then there's, of course, less time for us to make a contribution. Uh, from my own experience and also from some of the data, in part, some of that was uh, this at least my own experience first, first I'll start with, was the, the career path, well first I'll work and then I'll get some experience and then I'll get my employer, which I'm very grateful my employer supported my PhD education, um, but it was a much more linear approach and, and purposeful. And I think that's for some of us and, and the data would even support that. I also think um, this the, the idea of the love of discovery it's not yet as universal across the profession as I would like it to be. And it might be in earlier times anyway that it was later on where one realized the opportunities they have as a professional nurse. There, I think the program timing as well, There, but many changes have occurred. We have some actually deans in the room maybe would like to comment as well in our own experiences. But I, I, we're more purposeful. We look funding from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to create opportunities to have an expedited pathway, if you will, that might not be the right words, but if you'd like to, thank you. Hi. Um, there has, thank you for your, your report there. Mm -hmm. um, there has been special programs like the RWJ at UNC. We have the Hillman mm -hmm. Innovative Scholars, which goes from BS directly to PhD, and that is, it's really trying to reduce the amount of time. Uh, there's a lot of sometimes controversy in our in our among our own colleagues mm -hmm. because people still have this mentality that well you need to practice so many years and then come back but that doesn't happen right so we need to really encourage these young you know uh, especially now that we have those accelerated programs that are people comes with one degree and have a second degree you know they have other educational background and skill sets that, that really would pose you mm -hmm. know will do well. So so those have been some successful and some of the, like the Hillman Scholars, part of the, I think the goal is that we create programs like that or modeling like that at a national level so right. that it's not and, a And we have thing. some great results from yes. those programs. Some of those who express concern then and maybe even still now uh, felt strongly, and I'll just represent a, a portion of the group, about the importance of having years of clinical experience and without that thought that one didn't have the context that would be important to then um, apply as they were going through the PhD programs. We have shown that that concern it doesn't exist in reality to the extent that people think it has and there's um, but it is important to understand the profession uh, that there are different ways to do that but that more of that would be as I would argue escaping from the old but literally when I graduated you needed to be a nurse for a couple years I couldn't even get the support from my employer for my tuition assistance until I'd worked for a period of time now part of that was a business decision but um, but it was that so but we're changing I mean I think they're seeing more changes and different kinds of support available uh, and, and we have to do more early on to recruit and help people see that how that opportunity could be of interest to them. Um, <clears throat> I just wonder how up to date our data are in the, just the last six to eight years. Um, and both at, at my institution and once I'm going around the country, it's been a rapid shift of young BSN to PhDs. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, in our place, almost all are, th are that now. Maybe it's because we go after them. Um, but I, I, I see a rapid shift. And so we keep saying they're older, but I just wonder if we're responding to the shift. 
well, um, and that we're not holding on to an old idea. Yeah. Now, when I do go across the country, you know, we keep saying we want more PhD programs, I guess, but then there's concern about the quality. And what I do see is that some of the newer programs uh, or some that are what I would call less research uh, focused do admit older students. So I think we need to be careful about saying, are, when we say more PhDs, are we just saying people to be faculty in schools of nursing across the country? Are we thinking about nurse scientists? And start breaking our data down to look at the, the people who are setting out to be nurse scientists who have careers in that area and what were their career tra trajectories and especially with this shift. Because I, I think sometimes we're still um, thinking more programs are better. I'm not sure that's true when I look at who, what the success of the people there and what they're doing. They are producing faculty, okay, and that is a need. But that's a different need than I think just um, our, our nurse scientists. I would agree with what you just said, I, and I think it's both. We need to be able to have, of course, PhD prepared faculty. We also have DMP prepared faculty, but we also need those and should honor the pathway to become a scientist and perhaps not be in the academic community. Um, and that's not, um, you know, that isn't, they're not mutually exclusive. One can do both, but there are, and that again, when um, the Institute of Medicine at the time concluded their, their study, they also identified that the, the majority are working in areas other than academia, yet that isn't well known. Uh, we also don't have the uh, richest data as we need to understand this. And I think your point about age, we're looking at average, but I didn't bring, and I'll go back and we'll look at the breakdown. I believe our anecdotal experiences, and I'm not sure yet, but I would think the data would begin to show that there's an increase in the uh, younger age entering. These are uh, entering enrollment. I think what we showed were enrollments and graduations, but we need to look at both of those. Good point. Yes. Just a point of clarification. Uh, this is the first time I've heard that more PhDs are working in places other than academia. I, I don't know where I've been. I didn't realize that. And so that's just PhDs or nurse scientists. So the report that I'll recommend to you is from the Institute of Medicine in 2018, and that's the reference. So it was a, looking at biomedical um, services researchers, the consensus study, and that was one of the um, points that was raised in that report. That's not AACN data. Yeah. But do, do you want to, I mean, besides questioning the point, did you want to say more? No? Okay. Okay. You, you raised uh, the really important point that one of the deterrents to people in nursing pursuing academic careers is simply the long time it takes to gain independent funding, particularly R01 support. And it's true in nursing, but it's true uh, across many, many other, other disciplines. And we might understand that, but institutions often don't. They still say, the, the point at which you become an independent investigator and promotion and tenure and all is going to be after you get an R01. And it just seems that so many um, solutions to this haven't worked. You know, K9900 grants have not done it. Uh, uh, prioritizing early uh, uh, career uh, awards hasn't done it. Um, and um, I know in, in my, my world, I spend so much time is a senior person uh, helping people survive the five, seven, nine years it takes to, to, to get a, uh, an academic uh, R01 grant and helping people be resilient and thick-skinned and, and not give up. And I, I think that just much more broadly than nursing, uh, this, this remains a big problem. Um, and the expectations in academia very much haven't changed. And we simply make people feel like failures and get discouraged sooner. And maybe this is also, as you're pointing out, a deterrent to, to, to taking that career path, as well as some other ones, including nursing. Yeah, I would agree. It's... I mean, to, to sort of build on that, um, and this is, this is not an easy question I'm going to throw back to you because you've indicated that there have been several things that um, have been 
um, you know, several initiatives across NIH to try to address this problem. But, um, you know, what what do you think um, NINR in particular obviously could do to try to help uh, move the needle on this? It's easier to identify a problem than the solutions. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know. I said it wasn't an easy question. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I think, I think uh, uh, the things that are done are good things to do. But they haven't worked well enough. But I think the other the other angle is also uh, institutions need to be uh, much more aware because I think that that may be part of the problem too. Because we you know we'll see people that are obviously doing very very well. They've gained funding, but they're told by a rank uh, and tenure committee, oh sorry you haven't got an R one yet. And um, I think there's I think there. It's not just an NIH issue. I think that there are institutions and program people within institutions need to be simply aware that the world is different and, and we're going to snuff out people from, uh, you know, from developing what would be great careers. I will think more. Uh, one of the concerns I'm seeing lately is I'm seeing more than two uh, young investigators, excellent training, come out with their PhDs. They seem like they're all set and ready to go, but they feel the need to be clinically active three or four days a week and give a sliver of time to research, and, which is kind of disconcerting. They don't know that how they could integrate their practice into their research. They, they don't even seem to fathom that. They, not only do they need people, these are people who haven't necessarily said they needed years before they started. They need years after of direct clinical care. Do you think that those are external pressures, internal pressures, both? I do not think they're external or mm -hmm. internal pressures. It's choice. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you have any data available related to entry into PhD programs, enrollment, and the availability of funding, institutional funding, to, to uh, support the students. I know in public institutions, that's a major challenge, um, unless you can um, institute some type of strategy to help the students go through. So when you uh, try to attract your uh, potential PhD students from a BS or a fast and or a master's entry program, they're looking for the funding because they've sacrificed so much for their basic education. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I think we can, again, that's another area where we could do more. Uh, we do know that funding matters, uh, not just for our students, but for others that are interested in programs. And when the resources, the financial resources are there, that's one less challenge, one less barrier. Uh, but we can probably do more to, to look at that in a, in a deeper way. Mm -hmm. Did anyone else want to comment? That I just put up the one slide that again was an initiated. We actually we did a focus group survey that it came from. So some of the challenges that were identified again through uh, the IOM work now National Academy of Sciences were the challenges were uh, the length of a postdoc, time to tenure, like you were talking about the reward, the return for them um, because of and, and then limited funding streams. So those were some of the challenges. And then, uh, again, their specific recommendations were do more to promote recruitment by talking about how we can address and overcome some of these. And then the support, again, the mentoring is critically important to help navigate uh, both not just the, the um, resilience one needs in the program, but also the resources that might be available. And, and again, then funding for new researchers. And there's a, many of you may, next generation, what are uh, some of our research initiatives there? Yes. I want to go back to, to what uh, Deborah was saying, and I think funding is critical. And that has impact on what Rita was saying before on the T32 funding, mm -hmm. because without those mechanisms, you know, we have many, you know, people that want to do a PhD, but if you don't have the funding, they're not going to come. Mm -hmm. And that's a huge issue, I think, for all of us. I mean, I think that it particularly hurts our underrepresented minority students. So that, if we want to contribute to the diversity of our, our PhD graduates in nursing, we really have to look at that seriously. Mm -hmm. 
I would agree, and I think we need to look at all funding sources uh, because we're seeing even in uh, in a larger context uh, some of the foundations that used to be able to support this are not anymore, and and that's only one, of course, of many sources for funding. But I I will take that back certainly to AACN and with our community. But I I would agree that having a better understanding of what is occurring um, with respect to the financial resources is important but it's not growing dramatically anywhere that I'm aware of. I have one more thing that I didn't sure. say before, which you said, and I'd like to just expand upon. You talked about the love of discovery, and I know that some of us could do better. I know at times when I've had my mentees with me, they, they pick up the stress and the heavy workload, and so we can hear things like, I don't want a career where I have to work so much. Mm -hmm. What we can do to help them is point out we work so much because we love what we do. Yes, yes, yes. I, I would support that. Um, while I can't quantify it, I do think that sometimes we are not the role models that we could be that would help people see how meaningful these um, the, the education is to a rewarding and very satisfying career. Um, I don't have a lot of background in nursing schools or nursing training as a physician. However, I'm mentoring a few nurses and do faculty development on the physician side. And I just want to highlight the, er, that the areas of vulnerability from a funding perspective continue into early career <coughs> faculty yes. periods. And um, when certainly in medicine, often in nursing, especially uh, people who go into PhDs uh, earlier in life, are building families and mm -hmm. sort of the, the real tension between working over full time and having children at very young ages um, is a huge area where people simply stop. And one of the things, so funding for sure for early career professionals, K awards, those sorts of having time to write your K award. The, um, and then I've also noticed, and I don't want to I don't want to speak out of hand, but I wonder what the tension is between these vulnerable faculty and then this ask of teaching similar to how it works in medicine where you get sucked, not sucked in, it's a great thing to do to take care <laughs> of patients, but when you can't protect your own salary, yeah. you're, um, mm -hmm. you have less and less time to be able to be productive from an investigation yeah. perspective. Very good points, because a lot of competing pressures. So I have slightly different take on it, and I would like to add to this. We all know that the funding is critical, but I also think that the reviewers who are looking into the proposals, they are not really doing a good job. And very often they are just cutting the wings of the young researchers, coming up with the comments which are absolutely unnecessary, and also showing that they are <coughs> clueless about the project. So my suggestion would be maybe we should also look into education of reviewers who are being invited and um, maybe ask them to educate themselves what is a good constructive criticism and what is a negative criticism which is bringing up um, the lack of enthusiasm of uh, PhD students. Yes. This may be a, a change of topic, so if there's still more conversation about this other, I'm happy to wait a, a minute. But I think it is a topic about, that is important to the NINR, and that is do you want to go ahead with? Is, yeah, yeah, if you don't oh, mind, wait. I want to Not a, um, also add, um, one of the things that is clear is um, pace of productivity is uh, often assessed in the review process. And certainly, in, there are no opportunities, and certainly, I would say it's um, not at all, uh, I mean, I think you would sort of very much hesitate in either as a mentor writing a letter or as the applicant to comment on other factors affecting your productivity as an investigator. 
And I think that's a cultural issue, and I think that there's an opportunity for the NIH and INR to allow for and um, some input related to what's going on outside of your career to be able to assess that pace and not necessarily penalize someone who hasn't been as productive as their peer, even though they're highly talented. And I, I just don't think we um, have a mechanism to be able to allow for that. So you don't think that's getting captured in some of the recent changes made to the biosketch and other things? Um, do, do you think that's getting captured in some of the changes that have been made to the biosketch and some of the? Um, I guess I'm not 100 percent sure where that's reflected in the biosketch. Um, I don't know. Is that something encouraged to be? Because so yeah. yeah. So actually, on an, on the biosketches for F31s, for example, <coughs> the instructions, and I think for Ks as well, but the instructions speak to, or there's a. The, the, the instructions speak to the ability to explain or, to, you know, you have to do that carefully. And I think some of this is anxiety on the part of the applicant about maybe not having, you know, 20 publications when they graduate from their Ph.D. program and which most of Ph.D.s don't have. <laughs> so I think there's just this. Definitely not this one, I'll tell you that. <laughs> so I think there's just this, right. I mean, I think it's just this anxiety about what you're really going to need. And, and I, I also think it's a largely mentoring to um, help individuals tell their story in a way that is both accurate and compelling. So that's not easy to do either. But I think there's part of that. And I, I think. And I think it's reviewers understanding that people come from different places and do different things, and so um, everybody doesn't look the same. And you know, reading the story that's in front of you and not thinking about the story you read two applications previously, right? Yeah. So I know AACN has um, has put out some data that shows that most students who plan to seek academic careers felt confident in carrying out most of the academic tasks, but the one area that they felt less confident about was about reviewing and writing grant proposals. Um, so sort of building on what you said, Rita. And, and so, um, you know, I think uh, this is obviously a space that an ANR could do a bit better in sort of getting some information out and encouraging use of some of the existing resources we have here at, at NIH and within our institute to, to kind of help build um, folks' experience and exposure to these processes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. Did you have another question? Rita? Well, I did, but I want to make sure this we've we've discussed this topic. You know, I don't want to because this is a little bit of a change, and so we're n not a new idea. But I see increasing discussion about an interest in uh, admission to our PhD programs from individuals who are not nurses, and there are, there are scientists around this table who are not nurses mm -hmm. and who contribute to nursing science. And so I think one of the challenges we have when we talk about pathways to conduct nursing science is how are we going to bring individuals into our PhD programs that are focused on nursing science and help them to develop the skills they need to contribute to nursing science. I think it's, a, I think it's something NINR should be concerned about, probably is concerned about. A number of our program officers are excellent scientists, but they're not nurses either. But they are still contributing to how the science of nursing is developing. And that's really important to me. And mm -hmm. I'm, you know, struggling with, I'll, I'll say struggling, thinking about, we're working on how do we how do we do that within our within the context of our current educational programs? And will they get funding? And you, are they eligible for this and that and the other? And so there's a lot of questions about that. And I'm not sure that AACN has actually um, formally addressed this. Um, but I think it's we, we certainly have discussed it at the PhD conference, but in you know not in really systematic ways, I think. Sure. No, I, I think you're right. There have been ongoing discussions. There isn't a position per se. I would say from my own personal uh, opinion and experience that there is strong support for 
others to understand and can contribute uh, generally to the nursing science, but there's major concern that within the nursing community, there seems to be a waning interest in becoming a scientist. They're not mutually exclusive, but most of the conversation has focused primarily on what can we do to stimulate interest within the profession. But we have an upcoming doctoral conference and I'm sure more discussion with respect to the larger uh, community, what you're talking about, in that we're making advances um, and people understand the science of nursing um, and are making a contribution. I, good point, thank you. These are all very good points. So clearly not one size fits all, and I don't want to stop if there are additional questions, but there's, there is definitely a love of discovery in this room, and we are committed to work with each of you and the larger community. This doesn't fall on the shoulders of just one organization. It doesn't fall on the shoulders of just the government. It really is a responsibility of all of ours. And I do indeed, many of you who know me know I'm an optimist, I do believe the future is bright, but I think we need to be even more purposeful about our actions if we don't want to be Sisyphus, and I don't want to be Sisyphus in this one. So uh, any other parting questions, comments? Uh, I will take your feedback back both to our board as well as we will be having some deeper conversations at the doctoral conference. And this is going to be ongoing work. I mean, none of us thinks we're going to solve it tomorrow, uh, but I think that we can continue to take some big steps forward. And I'd like to be able to say that when we look at the next set of data, one, we have more information about some of what you all have raised today, but that we also are seeing a stronger increase um, in those who are in the profession and pursuing this, not to negate the interest of others. I thank you very much for some good conversation, and I hope you have, and I'm sure you will, a good and rich rest of your meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Deb. That's always a very thoughtful and robust conversation and, and makes me look forward to the, the rest of the conversation even more um, for this afternoon. Um, so um, I think, you know, we should just go ahead and break early for lunch. Um, but um, before we do, just a couple kind of housekeeping things and um, other points. So um, typically uh, we announce some of the guests that we have here in the room. So guests, be prepared to be introduced. <laughs> um, we have a few guests here, from uh, one from AACN, uh, uh, Colleen Lewers, who's here uh, presumably with, oh, is she? Okay, in the overflow room. So maybe some of these folks aren't, aren't in the, or uh, join Colleen in the overflow room as well. Um, we also have Catherine Mackey here from the Clinical Center, um, Valerie Adelson from Oncology Nursing Society, and, and Christine Tochi from Duke University. So we appreciate all you, um, all you attendees uh, from, uh, from outside NINR and, and NIH uh, for, for traveling here to attend this meeting. Um, so as I mentioned, I think we could go ahead and break a little bit early for lunch. Um, when we return, we will hear from three early stage career uh, scientists um, about their career development trajectory and current research programs and hear about some of the specific barriers and facilitators that they've experienced along their pathway. Um, and uh, we are fortunate that Dr. Shirley Moore has agreed to moderate uh, the panel uh, Q&A following their, their presentations. Um, and as many of you know, Shirley has extensive experience as both a mentor and longstanding interest and passion for, for training junior investigators. So we look forward to that conversation and discussion. Um, but in the meantime, I just enjoy your lunch. The cafeteria, if you guys, um, I think you're all familiar with the building, but is upstairs on the first floor. And because we're getting done a few minutes early, what if we're back at 1230, just to sort of speed things along, give, maybe give a little bit more conversation. Is that okay with folks? No? <laughs> I see some yeses, some noes. Longer lunch, is that? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> okay, all right, you've twisted my arm. Um, all right, let's, let's be back at 1245 uh, on the dot and we'll get started. All right, thank you all. We're, we're venturing into our uh, discussion uh, with, with some trainees that we've invited here today. Um, so 
First up is Ms. Jacqueline Boyden, uh, who is a PhD candidate at the University of Pennsylvania School of Nursing, and she received a, uh, a Ruth O'Kirstein NRSA T, uh, F31 Individual Predoctoral Fellowship um, in 2018 for her dissertation study entitled Home-Based Pediatric Palliative Care Outcomes Study. Um, and she is currently serving as a student member of the Hospice and Palliative Care Nurses Association Research Advisory Council. Um, and has worked as a nurse educator and researcher at a variety of different places, including in the D.C. area. Um, so uh, we, uh, we welcome uh, Ms. Boyden to come give a little bit of a, a, an overview of her career path um, and, and provide some uh, uh, information to us about what her experience has been. And I guess one important thing to note, because this is coming very, very soon. It'll be here before she knows it. Um, she's planning to graduate in May 2020, so that's like, really exciting. <laughs> Thank you, Jackie. Um, good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much for the, the introduction and for this opportunity to be here to speak with you. Um, uh, just quickly, I have no financial disclosures uh, and want to acknowledge my two funding sources, the NINR um, and the University of Pennsylvania School of Nursing. So what I'm hoping to accomplish over the next several minutes is to first provide a brief snapshot of my journey uh, from a BSN nursing student to an almost PhD graduate. Um, and during this time, I'm also hoping to share with you uh, three lessons I have learned that I feel have been um, critical for facilitating this journey. So I'll start here with my journey. Um, so just very briefly, I received my BSN from the University of Michigan um, and started my nursing career as a pediatric intensive care nurse at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, or CHOP as we affectionately call it. Um, I received a master's in nursing and public health uh, from UIC in Chicago and then worked um, for a little while after that in the community-based setting, um, both in long-term care as well as in, um, as in hospice as a nurse educator and researcher, actually right here in the Metro DC area. Of course, now I'm currently a pre-doc student at Penn um, and also an F31 NRSA pre-doctoral fellow. Um, and so along this journey, while I feel I have learned many, many lessons, um, I just hope to share with you three here, again, that I feel have been particularly critical along, along the way. <clears throat> so lessons are this. Lesson one is to figure out what drives you. Lesson two is to build your team of mentors. And lesson three is to seek and be ready for uh, opportunities. And so I'll go over each of these lessons in greater detail now. So lesson one, figure out what, dri what drives you. Um, so I think I was uh, very fortunate along my career that I learned pretty early on what I am interested in clinically and what I'm passionate about. Uh, and I'm hoping to share with you uh, three of these areas now. So uh, pediatrics, I'll start there. Um, so I think I learned pretty early on in my undergraduate program at Michigan that I very much enjoyed working with children. Uh, but it wasn't until I started working as a bedside nurse in Peds ICU um, that I knew that working with children and their families uh, is a passion of mine. I also knew that as much as I loved helping children recover and leave the hospital, um, I knew that unfortunately for some families that seeing their child recover um, would never be an option for them. Um, and so I think I made it up to, I became particularly interested in helping these children and their families um, really have the best care experience that they could have. And this became a driver in the next steps along my journey. Palliative and hospice care. Um, I think also I was very fortunate that I had some early experiences um, in this field. Uh, so for example, um, at Michigan, um, I was one of I think maybe six, I think nursing students out of a class of over 100 plus that had the opportunity to complete a rotation in hospice during my undergraduate program. So I think that already sparked my interest in this field. Um, of course, I also had some experience working in palliative and end of life care um, as a peds ICU nurse. Um, but it wasn't until I was working um, in hospice care as a nurse educator um, that I had the opportunity to work with many different providers, um, from nurses to physicians, chaplains, social workers, um, it, both within the organization and out in the community setting. Uh, and I learned during this time 
that for, for many, not for all, but for many uh, providers, that working with children um, at the end of their life is a source of discomfort for them, deep discomfort in some cases. Um, and I think this um, really prevented some children and families from um, receiving the highest level of care they could possibly receive in the home setting. And so addressing this particular gap in care um, became, again, a next, uh, another driver, I think, along my journey. Uh, and then finally, home and community-based care. Um, so uh, particularly in my master's in public health program, um, it really drove home for me the lesson that no individual truly lives in a silo um, and that the health and the well-being of every person is deeply and intimately connected to the home in the community setting in which they reside. Um, and so I have a, this focus on a person's home and community, um, a significant portion of my research. Um, and so... I know we had some discussion about this early in the morning, um, but I think at least in my situation, um, these areas of clinical interest have really informed my program of research um, and have really helped drive my career goals going forward. Lesson two, build your team of mentors. Um, and so I just shared with you what I am interested in clinically, what drives me, what keeps me up at night, uh, besides my children, of course. Um, but without the, the support, the guidance, um, the cheerleading of many, many mentors along my journey, I truly could not be where I am today uh, without them. Um, and while I have had the great fortune of having had worked with many mentors along my career, um, in the interest of time, I just want to highlight and introduce to you a few of them who have played a particularly important role um, over the last several years of my career. Um, so I'll start on the top row. Um, Drs. Karen Kavanaugh and Teresa Savage uh, were my mentors at UIC during my master's program. Um, and I, they really um, introduced me to this world of palliative care research. Dr. Stephen Connor, also on the top row, was a mentor at Capital Caring when I worked in hospice. Um, and among many other reasons for why I'm grateful for Dr. Connor, um, he helped support my decision to go back for my PhD at the time. Um, the four individuals on the bottom row are um, who I'm going to call my dream team of mentors. Uh, they are the four people who are currently on my dissertation, dissertation committee. Uh, Dr. Mir Ersek on the right um, is my chair, uh, Dr. Chris Feudner, uh, Dr. Um, Janet Dietrich, and Dr. Kim Widger. Um, and they really have been instrumental in supporting me from even before I began my PhD um, to where I am today with uh, completing my research project and then planning the next steps along my career. And then finally, I know this picture missing, um, last but certainly not least, um, this person is perhaps the most recent addition to my team of mentors, but I am very grateful for his uh, knowledge, um, his guidance, um, just his overall a very supportive and positive style of mentorship over the past few years of my career. Um, and this person, of course, is Dr. David Banks, who you all know very well here today. So again, I think without um, the support and the guidance of these mentors in my life, um, I really could not be where I am today without them. Lesson three, seek and be ready for opportunities. Uh, again, I think I've, I've been fortunate and I have had many opportunities along my career, um, but I want to share with you two here today. Um, that have been really important for me for over the past few years. Uh, so I'll start with the picture on the top left. Um, that was a picture I took my very first day um, of uh, my PhD program. Uh, and as I know is obvious from the picture, uh, I was also very pregnant with my first daughter. Uh, she was, in fact, born that very weekend. Um, so not, not great timing. <laughs> um, but I am very grateful to be training at Penn for many different reasons. Um, and I just want to share with you a few here. Um, I think the first reason is that I have had the opportunity to um, take courses and learn from many different professors um, from many different schools, not just at the School of Nursing, but the School of Medicine, School of Education, um, the Business School. And I think having the opportunity to learn from so many different perspectives um, has really helped me to really um, enhance my own perspective, uh, to help me deepen my knowledge base, um, and to really broaden my research portfolio, my research training. Um, being at Penn, I also have the opportunity to work closely with many providers at the Children's Hospital next door. Um, and in particular, I have worked closely with the palliative care team at CHOP from the very beginning days of my program, where I began attending their weekly clinical team meetings. Um, and I think this was a, a very um, important opportunity for me to stay uh, clinically grounded at a time where I'm not currently working clinically uh, during my program. 
um, also uh, this team of providers has really truly supported me in my research project from the very beginning days of uh, my design um, of the project to where I am today with recruiting participants. Uh, so I'm very grateful that for them. Uh, and then finally, being at Penn, um, I mentioned I had my daughter the first week of class. Um, and uh, being a, I think, rather naive first time mom, I had no idea how hard it would be to have a baby in the first place, um, let alone I have had two babies now in, my pro in a full time PhD program. Um, and I think the university has been very supportive of me, and many professors at the university have been very supportive um, along this journey in helping me try to find that balance between pers my personal and professional lives. Uh, so, for example, I was able to take the um, semester following that first semester off. I took leave that next semester and really spent that time really learning how to be a mom in the first place. Um, and then um, figuring out how to integrate that part of my life into my career. Um, and so, of course, this is still very much a work in progress, but um, it's something that, again, I think I'm very grateful for the university for having supported me uh, through this so far. The second opportunity, of course, I want to highlight is my F31, um, which I, I received last uh, at the beginning of last summer uh, for many reasons. I'm very grateful for this opportunity. But in particular, um, I think this opportunity has given me um, the gift of time in my program, um, where now I no longer need to work as a teaching assistant to support my program. So I'm able to focus a lot of my time and energy uh, on my research training, which has been very important. Um, of course, this fellowship has also provided me funding to present my work at conferences in my field, um, as well as providing the dollars to carry out my research project. Um, so, of course, I'm very grateful. Um, and so I think um, the lesson here, I think, is no matter where you are, to look for those opportunities that will facilitate your career um, and to be ready for them, even when you may not feel so ready for them. Uh, so I mentioned my dissertation study earlier. Uh, I, in the interest of time, I'm just going to introduce it here, um, and I'm happy to talk about it further with anyone who's interested later on. Uh, so the goal of my NINR-funded um, uh, study is to develop an instrument to evaluate parent-reported experiences with home-based palliative um, and hospice care for children and families. Um, as you can see by this school, um, it is truly a culmination of all of my clinical passions, from pediatrics to hospice and palliative care to home-based care. Uh, where I am currently in my project, I am finishing up data collection, um, hopefully in the next couple weeks, um, and we'll begin the formal analysis and write-up um, shortly after that. So the next steps, uh, I am planning to defend my dissertation in April, um, and um, as Dr. Charles mentioned, graduate in May. Um, I will then plan to begin a postdoc fellowship at CHOP over the summer. Um, I actually recently submitted my F32 application in December to hopefully fund that uh, position, so fingers crossed. Um, I, after that, beyond that, I plan to hopefully obtain a nurse faculty position um, and then apply for my first K-level award. Uh, so just to summarize, um, again, based on my clinical interest, um, with the incredible support from my team of mentors, um, and kind of uh, having those opportunities that have really facilitated my journey, I'm able to con continue to work towards my career goal, um, which is to improve the palliative and hospice care provided to all children with serious illnesses in their families, um, but particularly those who spend the last phase of their life at home. So with this, I just want to say thank you to the NINR for this opportunity to be here again um, and for their um, incredible support of my research. In particular, I want to thank Dr. David Banks and Dr. Jerry Miller. Um, I want to thank Dr. Tara Schwetz for the, for the invitation to be here. Um, and then again, my mentorship team, my colleagues and friends at Penn and Chop, and of course, my family. So with that, I just want to say thank you so much. <laughs> We'll, just a reminder, we'll save questions for the panel uh, discussion. Um, so next up, we have uh, Dr. Mark Lockwood. Um, and Dr. Lockwood's passion for clinical research began soon after starting his nursing career at Barnes Hospital in St. Louis, uh, Missouri, uh, Wash U. And over his more than two-decade nursing career, he has acquired skills in the methodology, methodology and implementation of complex research protocols involving novel medications, medication adherence, and health inequities among kidney transplant recipients. Um, in 2012, he was accepted in the PhD program at um, OHSU School of Nursing, and his dissertation work included 
three important studies examining facilitators and barriers to completing the pre-kidney transplant evaluation. So he has um, completed the NINR Summer Genetics Institute Fellowship. Yay. Um, and in 2019, he was awarded a K-23 mentored uh, patient-oriented Research Career Development Award from NINR um, for the study entitled Changes in Oral and Gut Microbiota and Incidence and Severity of Patient-Reported uh, patient reported Symptoms in Pre- and Post-Kidney Transplant Patients. So um, with that, we'll turn it over to Dr. Lockwood. Great. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here today to talk about my journey to become a nurse scientist. And as you can tell from the title, uh, the nurse scientists and the mentors that I met along the way were really important, played a very important role in my progress. So I want to talk a little bit about the timeline uh, of my nursing career, talk about facilitators and barriers to my progress, and then talk about ways we can engage um, early career nurses in nursing science. Now, I know this is an incredibly busy slide, but I only want to point out really three things on here. The first thing is that my nursing career really unfolded in three phases. The first phase was my early training and my time as a critical care nurse. Uh, my second phase and the longest phase was my time as a clinical research nurse. And the current phase I'm in now is as a scholar and a nurse scientist. Uh, I also want to point out that in 2009, my trajectory uh, changed when I, uh, for the better, when I uh, entered the uh, MSN program at Loyola University in New Orleans. And finally, I want to point out that, as you see from the timeline, there was a 12-year delay in resuming my education after I completed my bachelor's degree. So we'll talk a little bit about some of those facilitators and barriers as I went through. So in uh, phase one of my career, uh, I worked in a thoracic surgery unit at Barnes Jewish Hospital with uh, Joel Cooper, who was the father of uh, lung transplantation. And there was an intensive clinical training program there. Uh, I had a lot of nurse preceptors, but I didn't really have any nurse mentors, per se. And uh, this was really my first exposure to clinical research, although you know it was pretty uh, minimal uh, a role that I played. And uh, I really wasn't thinking about nursing as science at this point. I was thinking of nurses as clinicians at this point in my career. And it's probably because I didn't really have access to masters or doctorally prepared nurses at this point in my career. So after a few years, I made a transition into my role as a clinical research nurse at Washington University in St. Louis. And this is really when I began to have research mentors as part of my career trajectory. And I began working exclusively with kidney transplant patients. Um, I also gained expertise as a clinical research nurse. I became certified by the Association of Clinical Research Professionals, which was the first professional organization that I belonged to Although I wasn't really active, I was really just a member because of the certification. And still, even at this point in my career, I really don't have any access to nurse scientists uh, to guide my career path. Although Dan Brennan, who is an incredible uh, transplant nephrology, nephrologist, was a, was a wonderful mentor to me and really encouraged me to write manuscripts. And, uh, but I think at this point in my career, I was lacking confidence. I, I really didn't have the role models as nurse scientists uh, to, to guide me. And uh, I considered uh, pursuing my master's degree at this point, but financial uh, constraints uh, made that not possible at that point. Uh, in 2009, this was a major pivotal time in my trajectory. Um, this is when I was working at the University of Chicago, and uh, I started an online MSN program at Loyola University. A colleague that I was working with decided she was going to go through the program and asked if I would do it with her. I said, sure, why not? Because there was 100% tuition reimbursement. So I thought, I'll just give myself a raise, right? I mean, this is great. Uh, well, it turned out to be a lot more than that, because this is where I started to have my first exposure to nurse scientists who were actually, their work was changing healthcare, And it was very inspirational for me. I also joined the International Transplant Nurses Society at this time. And this gave me exposure to a multitude of nurse scientists who were very accomplished, who were working with solid organ transplant patients. So at this time, I actively sought out mentors. And I also started to seek out leadership roles at the University of Chicago. I was the co-chair of the Evidence-Based Practice and Research Council. And through this seeking of mentors, I eventually came across who became my chair, uh, my dissertation chair, uh, Christopher Lee. 
uh, who is a wonderful mentor and an excellent neuroscientist. So for that 12 year period, I didn't have any access to any neuroscientist. And now I start the MSN program and now I'm drawing uh, nurse scientists and mentors from three different areas, right? I'm drawing them from my education, drawing them from my professional society that I belong to, and also at my work at the University of Chicago. So at the end of 2016, I accepted a position as assistant professor at the University <laughs> of Illinois at Chicago. And this is when I really had, uh, the first time I had the organization invest financially to support my success as a research scientist uh, through startup funds and through internal grant awards. And again, I continue adding to my list of mentors, uh, some fantastic neuroscientists at, at UIC, and now I'm expanding my scope to include microbiologists, other physicians. Um, UIC also offered resources to help build my confidence, grant writing workshops, think tanks to help me improve my grant writing, uh, and that helped improve my confidence and my skill um, now, at the time I graduated, I didn't have the financial resources to pursue a, a postdoc. So I negotiated with uh, the College of Nursing and they allowed me a, one year, a truncated year, to focus on training and professional development. And I took advantage of that and that is how the NINR entered my life because I applied for the Summer Genetics Institute in 2017 and I'm a graduate of the class of 2017. And this was critical because I was looking to change my program. Uh, you know, the omics was becoming, you know, it's obviously a hot area and I really wanted to be part of the omics revolution that's occurring. And uh, the Summer Genetics Institute allowed me to expand my knowledge of genomics. I left understanding the <laughs> language of genomics so I could go back to my institution and meet colleagues and collaborators um, who would eventually become part of my team today and help me write uh, my K23 application. And it also led to additional uh, training uh, related to the microbiome. So I was very fortunate at the end of 2019, uh, I, was, I received uh, a K23 through the NINR. And here's my excellent team who's headed up by Stephen Green, who's a microbiologist at the University of Illinois Chicago. And the focus of the study, we're looking at changes in the oral and gut uh, microbiota and the incidence and severity of patient reported symptoms after transplant. And even after patients uh, have that kidney transplant, they have that restoration of kidney function, a good, uh, there's a lot of patients who still complain of fatigue, anxiety, sleep disturbance. So I became interested in the brain gut microbiota axis. And we're using a longitudinal design. We're collecting samples before the patients have their transplant, one week after and three months after. And we're gonna look at changes in the community and see how they relate to symptom burden. But we're also using shotgun metagenomics sequencing to look at the gene content and see how that is associated with different uh, outcomes as well, including uh, symptom phenotypes. So what are some things that we can do to help encourage early career nurses to pursue a career in nursing science? Uh, reducing financial disincentives is critical. That tuition reimbursement is really changed the trajectory of my, my career. Uh, and, and it was very, very important. Uh, increase early career um, nurses' exposure to nurse scientists. And uh, raising the profile of the nurse scientist. I'm really surprised when I talk to my students how few nurses in the program know what a nurse scientist is. Um, so on, on reducing financial disincentives, again, this is from a study of nurses who are, uh, they had completed their associate's degree, they asked them what were the barriers to pursuing uh, your bachelor's degree, and of course, financial disincentives were number one. So tuition reimbursement programs are very, very important. Uh, that if, if I had not had that available to me, I probably wouldn't have pursued my master's degree. I probably wouldn't be standing here. I'd probably be working in industry instead of standing here. Uh, loan forgiveness um, is really important too. So if uh, the students have to take on loan or take out a student loan, if there's some expectation that there may be some loan forgiveness at the end, that may be a way to incentivize uh, nurses. So again, this is taken from the NIH Loan Repayment Program website. And as you can uh, see, the NINR didn't participate in this program for a while, but they're starting to again. So this is really important. This is a way we can incentivize 
uh, nurses to take on that burden, that there's some expectation that they may have some type of loan forgiveness uh, by the time they're done. Again, it's really important that we're mentoring these early career nurses too. In that 12 year period, I didn't have any access to nurse scientists. I mean, it was kind of a different era maybe back then, it was a while ago, but um, we really need to increase our exposure um, to, to early career nurses. We can do this through formal mentoring programs, but I think even more importantly, we need to leverage this continuum that we have from bedside to academia through intra-professional nursing models. And there are some that have been proposed. There's a group here from Rush University, uh, but it's really focused on PhD prepared faculty and DNP prepared faculty working with DNP students. And I think it needs to expand beyond uh, the halls of academia and really get into the clinical setting because that's where we're gonna be recruiting our best and brightest uh, from the bedside. And I think it's also really important that we develop strategies to have evidence-based practice, QI, as part of uh, nurses' regular duties. Uh, this should be part of the nursing culture. This shouldn't be a side project that somebody comes in on their day off to work on or stay extra after work to work on. This needs to be incorporated into the uh, job expectations. And again, we need to raise the profile of the nurse scientist. Um, you know, we can improve marketing. There was some uh, talk about that earlier. We could leverage social media platforms to raise awareness. Um, who was our Neil deGrasse Tyson and Bill Nye? Do we need somebody like that to be a representative for nursing science and help raise the profile? Um, you know, we all know that the science that we do is very exciting and it impacts the community and it's, we should let people know, okay? So some of the things that uh, were the spark that I needed, I got that financial support through the, loan, or through the um, um, tuition reimbursement program. I had autonomy to pursue my goals, which helped. When I was exposed to the clinical research, evidence-based practice and QI and my master's program, that really gave me the spark to say, hey, you know, I can ask my own questions. Uh, and, and that was really uh, transformational for me. Uh, joining professional organizations and accessing the mentors through those organizations, uh, beginning to actively seek out mentors, and my willingness to adapt as opportunities arose. Um, so uh, I think the main key points are, uh, you know, I think early career nurses, uh, we need to find a way for them to understand the science that we do. I think a lot of times things stay in this room among the scholars and, and uh, we need to find a way to connect better with our early career nurses. So thank you. Great, thank you very much. Um, next up we have Dr. Margot Minissian, and she is a faculty research scientist, a clinical lipid specialist, and cardiology nurse practitioner at the Barbara Streisand Women's Heart Center, um, Schmidt Heart Institute at Cedar sinai Medical Center. Um, she is also the director of the Postpartum Heart Health Program Registry and Biorepository, uh, which has been designed to identify risk to identify, risk stratify, and treat women who experience adverse pregnancy outcomes. Um, and her early NIH-funded study uh, is spontaneous preterm delivery associated with clustering of maternal cardiovascular risk markers and impaired vascular function, received many awards in addition to an NRSA <laughs> predoctoral award that she got from us. Um, and she was most recently awarded a K99 ROO for her study, is spontaneous preterm delivery and preeclampsia associated with vascular or cardiac dysfunction. Um, and she's co-authored many publications and been involved in lots of, of groups um, and has received, she was the, actually the first nurse to receive the Outstanding Advocate of the Year Award by the American College of Cardiology and the Coalition to Reduce Racial and Ethnic Disparities in, in Cardiovascular Outcomes, our, our Credo Award. So, um, so thank you, Margo, for, for coming. Dr. Thank you so much. And just... Uh, such an absolute pleasure to be here today. And uh, this picture of uh, Dr. David Banks and I standing next to your sign, I was in this lovely young lady's chair uh, as a guest, not as a presenter. So that's a wonderful honor. And I was in such awe of all of you in this room. It was so inspiring to me. And it's just a, 
a real pleasure to be here. So thank you so much for the invitation. So for all of us who have kids in the room, see a need, fill a need. And that's really what was driving uh, my career goal. I was um, an acute care nurse practitioner and a clinical nurse specialist student at UCLA. Uh, I had graduated from this combined program in 2005 and stepped into my very first role as uh, an acute care nurse practitioner who was charged with starting a woman's heart program uh, in Los Angeles at Cedar sinai uh, so 15 years later, with a $37 million endowment from Barbara Streisand, we are the Barbara Streisand Women's Heart Center. And so it's been very fun to be on this journey. And along this journey, having the opportunity to be with many different mentors. Um, but being in the clinic and being able to really see gaps in care, I mean, I started in heart failure. I'm an old ICU nurse from over 20 years ago, and I got really sick really fast of watching young people die too young in our ICUs. So having an opportunity to go into prevention and finding ways to supplement that education. I got a board certification as a lipid specialist because see a need, feel a need. All these women with statin myalgias that I take care of, and uh, I speak on this topic all the time. Uh, because it still continues to be a problem, really has been my mantra, I feel, um, in life up to this point. So uh, in this uh, Women's Heart Center of mine, with a, a robust research team of over uh, 20 researchers, uh, we had 20 different studies ongoing at every single moment, and I started off uh, coordinating studies um, for uh, our medical director and then started a toy with ideas and got my first $5,000 grant from the National Lipid Association, which I was so privileged that they actually gave me money to do something that I loved that I thought, well, hey, I'm just going to dive into research and a PhD, why, why would I need to go back to school? I've already, I have a chemistry undergrad, I have a bachelor's of science in nursing because UCLA didn't accept bachelor's in chemistry, uh, even though I had an RN and so, you know, I, and I have an associate's degree in nursing, uh, not sure if I mentioned that. So, you know, you start to think about all these extra years of school. So, uh, Dr. Karen Huss, uh, Karen really impacted me significantly in a huge way. Uh, and in uh, 2010, I was sitting at the American Heart Scientific Sessions in their young um, faculty investigator day, uh, where they really tailor uh, all of the education for young PhD students. And I was just absorbing this information. I was so uh, encompassed by uh, what I was learning. And I was thinking to myself, OK, there's a lot out here. I really, um, I, I don't even know enough to even know that I don't even know enough. And it was starting to come to that point. And so I asked her if she would talk with me, which she was you know, so gracious with her time. And, and uh, I remember her saying, now, Margo, if you want to maintain intellectual property over your ideas, a PhD is a must. And I literally wrote my application to UCLA at the meeting and had it submitted by the 1st of December. And AHA happens, what, the second week of November? So I uh, got it in in a whirlwind, uh, but it took me uh, two to three years to really think about how on earth I was going to uh, be able to really fund myself and cover my time in clinic because if I was going to go back and get a PhD, I want to make sure that I had enough time with it. Um, so with that being said, uh, Despite all of this wonderful information, I really feel that you really truly need to have an aha moment with your topic. As you've heard our, our other uh, presenters today, they, they all have this, this uh, idea um, that comes to them and it really needs to spark interest. And so um, this is Dr. Janet Rich Edwards uh, from the Brigham. And coincidentally, 
Jan is at Cedar sinai and I missed dinner with her last night and presenting my research because coincidentally the timings were the same. Uh, but she uh, was a principal investigator of um, the nurses' health study, and she really came up with this idea of the life course uh, and uh, of pregnancy, and that pregnancy really serves as your first free physiological stress test and that there are so many adverse pregnancy outcomes that occur and increased uh, mortality in young women uh, within weeks after they deliver up to day six. It's you know really significant. And so uh, I was sitting between Dr. Barry Mers and Dr. Sarah Kilpatrick, chair of OBGYN, you know, director of Women's Heart Center, and I look over at them and I'm like, this is my topic. This is what I'm going to go after. It's perfect. It's not too broad. It's not too narrow focused. And it's over the branch of loving everything cardiovascular prevention. And so this is the phase of where I really target uh, my current ideas in research um, is uh, uh, intervening at this stage so that we can ultimately uh, alter a woman's health trajectory altogether, completely avoid heart disease altogether. So when I was starting to get ready for this PhD program, I really wish they would have had a workshop prior to actually starting it because they don't really share with you that you really need your question flushed out about, oh, the first day you get there. Uh, luckily for me, I had a topic and I had been bouncing around a specific AIMS page already because I came from a very developed research uh, institute, but if you don't have that, uh, I had 12 um, colleagues and I really, f I watched them fluster with it because they're trying to finagle with the topic and then they would, some of them got frustrated and then they completely switched topics, which really was kind of suicidal um, watching it because at the end of that first year, as you all know, you have to submit your written work and if you didn't write all of your coursework, on your topic, you were up all night uh, writing, re rewriting things that you had done in assignments prior. Uh, I had a fair amount of publications stepping into the program also, which was very helpful, but as we all know, if you, you know, want to be competitive for these pre-doctoral awards, having some publications uh, really um, is a feather in your cap. And then the three years that it took for me to figure out how I was going to pay for elementary school, which by the way was $20,000 a year um, compared to my $5,000 a year. Luckily, my husband says, well, I, I don't know. You know, as that year goes by and the application's in, you know, both my boss and my husband, who both heavily rely on me for many different things, are like, I don't know, do you really need that PhD? My husband's like, oh, we can't afford it. You know, too many people, school, ah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, it really was a huge sacrifice. My husband is a saint. Uh, you know, if it wasn't for him, I really wouldn't have, uh, have been so successful. But uh, we were able to finagle it out, but I was a Dean Scholar awardee, so that financially made it um, realistic for me. Uh, when we start to think about optimizing our work, as I said, writing all of your topics at the beginning, if there was a workshop of the nitty gritties of PhDs at the beginning, that would have been great. Uh, this was my, uh, my very first paper I actually wrote in my program uh, was my literature review, which I was able to turn into a mini meta-analysis and get it into CERC. Uh, and so it, these things are wonderful, putting them in our back pocket. Uh, and then being able to publish every paper, you know, giving other different types of tidbit information that's really helpful uh, for young um, uh, uh, PhD students. Uh, grant officers, our relationship with NINR, really, if it wasn't, if it wasn't for Dr. Banks and Dr. Huss, I, I probably wouldn't have the close relationship. We are now, you know, seven, eight years, um, you know, working really closely together and uh, having an opportunity. Um, Dr. Yoon is my grant officer on my K99R and it's just been a wealth of information in helping me be successful. Uh, so helping to increase and foster that really was a win for me, uh, but allowing that same opportunity for others uh, I think would be really helpful. Increasing uh, stipends for students to travel. 
um, you know, specialty meetings where NINR officers attend. Uh, and if you're going to the DC area, please, please, please go meet with your mentor. And you never know who you're going to meet. I happen to get to meet Dr. F. F. Melise, who was coincidentally the author of my uh, my book on nursing theory. And I wish I had it with me. I would have had her sign it, uh, which she does. And then, of course, helping us find balance. Finding balance is so incredibly important. And you know, at Cedars, we have this work-life balance program. You know, I, I think that, you know, it's important for us as students, we usually wear multiple different hats. And so for me, you know, the harder I work, the harder I play. And so this was a picture of me. I um, got to be the uh, reserve national champion with my horse uh, a couple months. I guess that was before I actually defended uh, my dissertation. And um, that was me in October. And that's my baby horse. And we were top 10 in the nation. And so I give myself other things to look forward to. Um, you know, life outside of science, I feel keeps me fresh, it keeps my mind creative, and um, continuously thinking outside of the box. And I want to thank you for your time very much for this opportunity. Thanks very much. So, Shirley, I'll turn it over to you to. I, yeah, I think the the folks um, can if they can join the table. I don't know if down here or down there, one of the ends may be um, better. I think, that, and then you don't even have to move. Okay, thanks a lot. Those, um, you know, there's nothing like stories to bring to life um, real world experiences. And so, really appreciate hearing your stories and um, filled with facts along the way. But um, uh, just the way you did it was great for us. So, the purpose of this panel is to seek the opinions um, of our trainees and then engage in a discussion with the whole council regarding. Um, essentially the goal of improving neuroscientist training. All right, so you guys have the lived experience, and so we're interested in um, how we can um, kind of long range, how we can improve the actual training programs themselves and attract people to them. So um, that's kind of um, the, the set of questions that I have. Um, so the process that we'll use is that I'll ask some questions here. Um, and then um, at the end of each, I think at the end of each question, we'll kind of uh, open it for more comments and discussions on the group. We really hope that this is interactive um, and um, kind of um, enlightening uh, all of us here. Um, so my first question, uh, this is one I didn't come prepared with, but it, it dawned on me while you guys were talking. And there's a lot of discussion today in the nursing doctoral community about um, um, DNP versus PhD training. And I was struck by the amount of clinical experience each of you had and that you had a choice to make, uh, all of you, in, in your phases of whether to go for the DNP or the PhD. So I'm interested in um, maybe just a, a minute or so from each of you or two minutes about your thoughts about that and why you made your final decision on that, so. So, I actually am not so sure I felt like I had much of a... Uh, yeah, I, uh, I'm not sure I necessarily thought I had much of a choice because my clinical experience was as a clinical research nurse, and not nece necessarily uh, working in direct patient care and I had considered a DNP program, but then I thought I'd have to go back and get more experience in the ICU, and I was at a point in my career where I really couldn't do that. 
So really for me, the natural path, having you know, worked managing clinical trials as, as a clinical research nurse was the, the PhD because of its focus on, on research. For me, I had evaluated both programs. The DNP was just really sort of up and coming at that point, at least on the West Coast. And also for me, it was not really a, a decision uh, I, that I really seriously considered because I had this love for research. And what I have done, although I'm very clinical, I have created my clinic as my lab. I have a registry and a biorepository. Every time I touch a patient, I am collecting data. And so I uh, came with a unique opportunity because I was the national chair for the nurses for the American College of Cardiology for about eight years. And with that came a lot of leadership experience. And I felt that the DNP really provided a lot of you know, leadership um, that extra leadership component and more of an operational uh, direction. And when I came to that fork in the road, uh, research was pulling me in that direction. Hear me? Um, I think for me, I also um, didn't really think actually much about the DNP um, going into it. I, I might have it might be back going back to my early exposures to the mentors in your life and who you've worked with and are exposed to. I think what Mark said in his presentation earlier, he didn't have that exposure to some neuroscientists early on in his career. Um, for me, I think it was the opposite, where um, I had exposure to nurse faculty, nurse scientists um, from very early on in my career as an undergraduate student. Um, I, during that time, I was in the honors program at Michigan um, and was able to work closely with uh, nurse faculty, uh, Dr. Linda Strowman, actually, on her work looking at good death. Um, and so I think that early exposure to nursing research um, really helped um, spark my interest and really helped me learn what nursing research is very early on. And so, again, for me, I didn't actually even look at the DMP um, when I was um, thinking about my doctoral education. Were both of you, um, are, were any, you were, some of you were nurse practitioners, however. There's Yes, I'm a nurse practitioner on SCNS. Are the other two? I'm not. Okay. 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 Any comments from the group here about, I mean, we have this idea that people are making this huge decision. I'm not sure I heard that here. Um, but th that's the word out there, right? That we're, and we're in positions of counseling people one way or another. So, next question. It's a little bit different than that. But each of you talked a lot about mentors who mattered a lot, and, and also all of you talked about not one mentor, but multiple mentors at different points. Wonder if, if you just thought of one thing that most impacted you and your career development uh, from a mentor, what, we, what, what did the mentor do, the, the one thing somebody did that most that was helpful to you? Well, he just stole my second question, oh. uh, which was all of you said mentors were important, but we didn't hear what they did specifically. So one or two things of what they actually did, and I'm even thinking there's the application process, and then there's the training period, and those, what they did might be different in both of those, but I just want to spark it could, that. It could even involve personal support, too. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to go on that. Uh, for me, it started off with Dr. Barry Mers, the cardiologist. I uh, was in an area where I was the only nurse around. And, you know, I would always see that as something negative. But now looking back on it in hindsight, I think I gave great exposure of what a nurse should practice as. And I always practiced to the highest uh uh, autonomy um, of my license and uh, to be able to demonstrate that in front of other professions, I, I can now look and see that it was good. Uh, she took that and really optimized what I was good at, uh, program building, creation. Uh, she early on signed me up for the American Heart and the American College of Cardiology. I mean, I had just gotten out of nursing school and I did that and she also had me sign up for PCNA and the hospital paid for all those dues, uh, which was very important. And once she did that and she was, uh, she was a board of trustee of the ACC at the time, 
Uh, so she signed me up for all kinds of volunteer opportunities, and she gave me opportunity to travel, and they gave me some travel monies to go along with it. And before you knew it, I was the chair for the nurses for California, and then a few years later, I was the national chair, and I was still pretty darn young, and uh, it, was, it was a wonderful opportunity. I, I think that's really kind of what got me headed in the right direction. So I think for me, maybe I can break it down into my um, decision to go back for a PhD and then um, my PhD uh, currently. Uh, so I think I mentioned again, there's several mentors in my life who helped support that decision to go back for a PhD. I mentioned Dr. Stephen Connor at the time because that was where I was working as a nurse educator. Um, and again, um, he really helped um, me talk through that decision and is it the right time for me in my career? Is this the right time to go back? Um, would it, is it going to be you know, beneficial for me to go back at this time? Um, so he really helped me, really helped me talk through that decision, think through it, and make that decision. Um, again, I think my my mentors from master's program also, I was able to keep in touch with them, and they also kind of helped talk through some of those decisions with me. Um, I think the other decision a point that I had to make was um, where to go for a PhD, and so I applied to several different programs. Um, and um, spoke with, again, my mentors in my life and tried to figure out where would be the best fit for me to go. And I, there, there's more decision, decisions there um, than just um, you know, which program. Of course, there's a lot of other life decisions that came into that decision-making process. Um, but um, I actually had a conversation with uh, Chris Feudner, actually, um, when I was applying for PhD programs. And he really, again, helped me kind of sit down with that decision and talk through which um, the strengths and weaknesses of each program, like what might be the best fit for me in selecting a program. Um, so I think in that decision-making process, I think mentors have really helped support me and really helping me. I, I think I, I knew what I wanted to do in terms of I knew I wanted to go back for a PhD, but they really helped me kind of, kind of support those decision points and help me talk through those decisions. So I'm interested. These were planned sit-down discussions about your development or you said, I'm thinking about going back, will you have lunch with me? I mean, I'm trying to figure out how formal versus informal. Um, um, for me, they were pretty formal. Um, of course, I, there are people, mentors in my life that I worked with, and so I saw them often, of course, and we did talk informally, I'm sure, at some point about them. But I can think of two conversations in particular where I sat with Dr. With Steve, Dr. Connor and really talked through that decision and told them, I'm thinking about this, what do you think? And we talked through that decision. Um, and with Chris, I actually had a call scheduled with him and really, again, talked through that decision. And this is what I'm bringing to the table, what I think is right for me, but what are your thoughts and what are the you know advantages, disadvantages, things like that? You know, just to add to that, I, I mean, I think you get different things from different mentors, and that's why it's really important to have a, a, a broad range of mentors. You know, I have mentors who are really great at providing professional advice, uh, Clinical advice, I have mentors who are really excellent at providing, you know, hey, you know, advice about life in academia. I mean, it's, uh, <laughs> you know, it's something you have to learn. It's not something that uh, uh, really comes naturally for me anyway. And I think uh, I was very fortunate. Uh, my dissertation chair was a very well-rounded mentor. He was a great clinician. He was an incredible scientist. But he's also a really great guy. So we had a series of, and this is for a lot of my mentors too, I mean, uh, you know, you could have informal conversations over the phone, or you could have more formal meetings when you meet at conferences, or when when I met with my dissertation chair. But I think I think you know you can it can be individual, and I think you know different mentors offer different things. So it's it's kind of a difficult question to answer. I think when you're early on getting started and you're trying to think through some of these really important life changing discussions. Having regular meetings with your core mentor group is imperative. And time gets away from all of us way too easily. So uh, even when I was at Cedar sinai my mentors at UCLA, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Lynn Doring and Dr. Joanne Eastwood, they have, they have known me 20 years. And they helped me know exactly, they knew my children, they knew my husband, they knew where they were in school, and when would be a good uh, for me to be most successful, when would that time be to step in where it wouldn't be too much of a shock for my family dynamics, uh, let alone, like I had mentioned, you know, financial uh, discussions. 
And, and so I met with them, even not being in the program, I met with them religiously quarterly for those like three years that I was preparing to step into the program at Cedar sinai with our team. Um, I have a one-on-one -on -one with our medical director weekly. I still do, and we talk out most of my research ideas. I'm flushing out specific games pages on all different kinds of things. It seems to keep the ball rolling. One of the things um, that have come up an issue also in writing for training grants is the timing um, in terms of your other, um, your other status. In other words, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, for, for instance, did you write for your F31 while you were in your PhD program or before you started it? Um, in other words, what provided you the time and guidance at that point to, to actually produce the application? Um, you have to be in a certain um, thing. So I'm just interested in why you decided on that at that t at the timing of that writing the application. Um, so I, I think I knew from the very beginning of my program that I wanted to apply for an F31 at some point in my program. Um, I think, I, again, I think from day one, I, I knew that was going to be, it's going to happen somewhere along my program where I would apply. Um, but I think that time when I decided to apply was really, again, discussions with mentors to see that, you know, do I have enough um, uh, of a project developed at this point, at least a plan for a project developed according to actually put it into an application and and um, and do it at that time. Um, I, I think what I, I'm trying to go back <coughs> to the timing of it. I think it was kind of when I was finishing up coursework and writing for my dissertation proposal when it kind of made sense to actually I, I wrote it in the dissertation seminar class actually. Um, so that was a time when where we did the dissertation seminar class where we. Um, we're putting together our dissertation proposal. And so it kind of made sense to write that application alongside my proposal. Um, obviously, it's all the same ideas and, and things going forward. So I think for me was, again, when I was finishing coursework um, and writing the proposals when I decided to submit the application. Did you worry that it would extend your PhD study time? If you got it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, that definitely uh, is what was a consideration. Um, uh, I think my husband was very um, wanting me to be done <laughs> sooner rather than later. Um, but uh, I, I don't think that played a huge role in my decision making. I think maybe it might be from my situation where um, I'm lucky that I have a spouse who's able to support me through this program. Um, on you know we we can uh, get by on his income, um, and so I think um, for me, adding an extra potentially year or so, two years onto my program. Um, would it have that, that wouldn't have been a significant, significant burden on my family financially. Um, but um, I know that for some other people, I know that is something that they consider and that they would add extra time to their program um, and where they are at in their program, it wouldn't make sense for them to submit an application by that point. So I think for me, the key was to learn, know, know early on that I wanted to do it um, and then really find that time to, to submit it. So Margo, when you were writing for your um KOO, right? Award. What, what was the timing of that, and where were you in your? I, I had both. Um, so I did. I did the F thirty one also, uh, and it was all sort of leading up to this ROO. So my my K ninety nine R idea came about four years before I actually submitted it. Uh, I had it written as a specific games page and stuck in my back pocket while I was flushing out the F31. Uh, I think one of the best things that UCLA has done is they actually have an NRSA course, a class. Uh, it's in the first year, it's in the spring. And uh, so with the, with the Dean Scholar Fellowship, I had, a, I had a full ride for two years that helped me bypass the TA, but they assume that you're going to write the F31 to help fund the second two years of it. Uh, I hadn't really given it a lot of discussion uh, that writing all these grants would actually extend time on to my uh, doctoral training. And I'm a little more like a freight train. I want to be done, and I want to do it right and you know, move along. And I, I didn't want to be in school seven years. 
Uh, and I got really close to having it done in four and a half and finishing like in December of 2016. Uh, but Lynn, Lynn Doring and I had this discussion on the phone and you know, they always say that doctoral students will eventually crack at some point, and I'm like, I am not going to crack. So when did you write the? the I, I wrote it. I wrote it. Um, I wrote it the the year after I graduated, and I was trying to submit it. I submitted it in twenty, in the October of 2019. I had it kind of ready to go by May. Um, the year before. So about 18 months over from the time that I had graduated, getting my three publications out and putting that K99R together. You were working in practice. I was. I uh, was, I was um, funded one day a week of freedom from Dr. Linda Burns Bolton, uh, who gave me a .20 to be able to write. And I was a writing machine. I, I actually went to the Pasadena Library where no one could find me. And I would take a lunch and I would sit there for eight hours. And I was very productive. Uh, thanks to her, I was able to accomplish as much as I had because I was on call four days a week and I was in 12 hours of clinic three days a week. Your investment paid off. Yes, <laughs> I hope so. Mark? So uh, I, I worked full time as I went through the program. Uh, so I went uh, through the program part time, which actually is more like three quarters time. So I wasn't eligible for a lot of uh, support. So I had to take out student loans. Um, I was fortunate because my job was flexible enough to allow me to, you know, add on hours here and there when I needed to to kind of compensate for the time. But, but uh, yeah, as a part time student, I, I really didn't have. Um, so you you available. finished your PhD and then you wrote the K right. um, twenty three or you before I finished my PhD and then started writing uh, the K twenty three as soon as I graduated, um, and uh, so I'm in my my third year now. So. Any comments on that from the group? Well, actually, I have a, a question to Jackie and. Uh, I mean, you are currently writing F32, right? While finishing up your doctoral dissertation. Oh, okay. Then uh, since that's kind of your most recent experience, looking back on it, what has been the most challenging part in writing the F32 while finishing up your doctoral dissertation? Um, it's very challenging. <laughs> um, it, it, is, it was uh, kind of a whirlwind of a couple months um, when we decided to submit it to when I submitted it. Um, and it was a whirlwind because I, of course, I am working on my dissertation study um, and, you know, of course, many other life things on top of that, trying to write an F32 application. Um, I think a couple of things that have helped me in the process. Um, the one thing I would say is that my F32 proposal is very, it's an extension. It was basically the next step in my dissertation project. So I'm developing an instrument for my F31. F32, I'm proposing to complete um, further um, testing on the instrument and some field testing and um, looking at um, the clinical actionability of the instrument. So I think it's very um, in line, applicable with my current dissertation work. So I think it has made it easier to write from that standpoint, where it is kind of an, extent, an extension of or what I'm do doing now. Um, so I think that was very helpful. Um, <laughs> The other thing that I think was helpful in the process was, so I um, I submitted my F31 to Penn, um, but I submitted my F31 to CHOP, since I'm cleaning my postdoc at CHOP. Um, and actually, I, I find the process submitting to CHOP actually was, um, uh, it was very helpful because they do have a, a, whole, a particular person that was able to work with along the whole process of, um, of uh, getting my application in. They have a, a particular department that actually helps with um, the sponsored projects department that actually helps with that. Um, and so I think having that point person to work with during the whole process has actually been very helpful for me in submitting the F32. I have another follow-up mentor question, which is um, we hear uh, often, at least those of us in academia who have doctoral students uh, that when they go to write their um, F awards or, and our, um, um, or postdocs, 
but they have trouble finding cl uh, clinical mentors, right? They, they've got the academic ones and the thing because they're hanging around, but finding the good clinical one um, is tough. So I just wondered a little bit about strategies you used um, along the way, or your experience was um, a couple of you are embedded in the clinical area, and maybe you had more trouble with the academic, I don't know. But um, I'm interested in about the clinical um, uh, mentors. And maybe you didn't need one for your. Um... Yes, um, what I would say to that is no, I, 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 it was not a barrier, obviously, um, for me. But I've always wondered, it's always um, been very interesting to me why uh, there has never been uh, a preceptorship, if you will, uh, to pair uh, students who are learning how to do clinical research and not pairing them with a preceptor who does clinical research. I had that synergistically by the way that I was functioning at work. Uh, but we should create that. You can't imagine you would train a nurse practitioner or an RN for that matter and not have them go through uh, precepting uh, in that environment. Uh, to me, that would be imperative to do. And one of the reasons why I don't think it's a good idea that, and I have not accepted jobs um, that um, have been proposed to me uh, recently because I want to keep my hands on patients, not 90% of the time, but just enough that I feel like I am still being um, stimulated and relevant. So I had been embedded in the clinical setting when I worked at the University of Chicago, but after I graduated, I accepted a position at the University of Illinois. Uh, and I didn't really know anybody there, um, but I, I think the goal is just to be persistent reach out to people, and, and in my experience, people are very generous with their time. Uh, you know, if you can uh, make the case and show how, you know, there can be some synergy between what you're doing and what they're doing, I think people are very uh, open and receptive to that. So I, I've just done a lot of cold calling and emailing and, and just been persistent about um, trying to make connections. And some take longer than others, but I, I think, uh, Overall, I think people are, have been generally receptive to that. Did you feel that they were there and it was just a matter of finding them and connecting or that they're, the researchers in the clinical area are scarce? Uh, in, in my area, they were there. So, so I didn't have a problem with that. So I don't know that I had many uh, formal clinical mentors. Um, I think maybe different from your experience. But um, what I can talk about is, uh, as I mentioned in my presentation, that I'm working closely with the palliative care team at CHOP. Um, and so I think they've really provided some of that clinical mentorship, so not research mentorship necessarily. Um, but they have really, again, um, I, I think I've gotten to know the team over the past few years, and they have really been very um, supportive and really have helped me with my research project, um, which is very important um, in, again, the design of it and even from carrying out the project where I am now with our identifying parents, with recruitment, things like that. They really helped me provide that clinical perspective to my project that, um, that I might not have um, you know, currently. So um, I think for me, I think that working with the team has been very important for my research. I have other questions, but I thought we'd open it up to the group now for questions um, of the, the panelists that you might have um, to go in any kind of direction that you, you might have questions about. So um, for these last 15 minutes, we'll keep it open. Okay. Um, thank you <clears throat> for your candidness and um, your openness about your experience, and it's really enlightening. Um, I'm going to take this opportunity to uh, kind of diverge into an area that's always of interest to me and others. And um, can you share with us about especially the journey and the process in the PhD program that you experienced where you were mentored or exposed to 
what we often refer to as the emerging majority population in this country and how health disparities are and should be researched and approached. And how did that influence you in the studies and especially the populations that you were studying? And then one last piece of that is who served as mentors to you in those areas and were they available? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, UCLA, we, the School of Nursing prides themselves on uh, uh, research in vulnerable populations. Uh, I had almost every professor that I can think of had, um, had populations in uh, Latino women's health, um, Native American uh, health, uh, we have, um, I actually did an NIH foundation grant um, studying uh, uh, ethnic uh, uh, women um, who live in inner city areas in Los Angeles and had received mentorship um, by Dr. Doring um, and Barry Merce to go out to these women in communities where they were and our dean um, studied homeless popu populations and uh, use some amazing models where she hired uh, uh, different uh, uh, people who lived in the homeless community and actually employed them to help uh, her, her research. And I think uh, Dr. Deborah <laughs> Konya Griffin is a perfect example, um, too, of, um, of studying um, our, our uh, Latina women and their, and their health disparities. Um, so I, I feel that that aspect of it was really good. It also helped for, uh, uh, for grant writing and um, for opening my eyes to um, special populations that otherwise are um, ignored. Uh, we have a lot of work to do, um, but I hope that us here at the table will um, help improve that. So uh, that's a great question. So I, I conducted my study at the University of Chicago, and uh, the focus of my dissertation was on mitigating barriers to accessing kidney transplantation. We served a really marginalized community there. And uh, I had access to a, a lot of great mentors there. Monica Peak does a lot of great work. And, uh, but, mo but they were mostly physician public health uh, mentors uh, at that time. Um, and that was a great experience. Uh, when I trans transitioned to UIC, my program really transitioned based on the needs that they had at the college. Um, so, uh, you know, I really have a goal to incorporate, you know, that back into my program at some point. But uh, right now, I've kind of moved out of that area. Of the country. Yeah, I'll take that. I know there's a lot of great resources at um, at Penn at the University at the School of Nursing in particular, looking at health disparities and um, health equity. Um, it's not a current focus of my research right now, um, but I do hope that in the future, I hope I can kind of again kind of look at more at that um, particular population, particularly in the in the palliative care space. You know, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Carol Ferens, who is an incredible uh, neuroscientist who's done incredible work, and she is. Uh, what I, who I consider, she's not my, assigned my primary mentor, but I consider her my primary mentor. She has been amazing. Uh, she, she's helped me with my grant writing, uh, and she's done incredible work um, helping improve screening uh, for African-American uh, women in Chicago. And she is always available anytime I have a question. So, so I think when I do incorporate that back into my program, I, I do think I'll have sufficient support to do that. Your question on this? I just want to make one comment first on this. Um, just another resource that I'm learning about um, for uh, enhancing scientists' knowledge about working with minority committee um, uh, uh, issues and, and uh, um, studying them in grants is um, our, our, for example, our local cancer center, okay, has received large NIH monies as it's a designated and they have a population health that reaches out, and they do a lot of work on 
um, running courses on recruiting minorities into research and then having appropriate tools and methodologies and that sort of thing. For, so I think we could also look to our practice sites who are very who are doing a lot of research there uh, on large trials where they're taking this very seriously. Um, at least I've just seen a huge shift in the last 10 years of, um, of, of the practice sites um, um, having holding a lot of expertise that maybe they hadn't before. So I just wanted to say that. Did you have something on this? I wanted to add to that, that the CTSIs and in, in institutions will have community engagement groups, which um, there's training in many of them where they have programs and then help with recruitment for diverse populations. No, but I think that does speak to the larger challenge that we have in nursing, in particular with our faculty, right? And, and I don't know if faculty around the country is like ours, but it's not a very diverse faculty. So it, so it is challenging, you know, when you're recruiting uh, people and students into your program. I mean, it, it does help to have uh, people that share, have a shared experience. And, and, and that's something that I think when we talk about that intra-professional model, you know, where we're, where we're leveraging that that continuum, we have you know, nurses at the point of care all the way to you know, the halls of academia. If we can leverage that, that's also a great way that we can recruit our best and brightest nurses who maybe wouldn't have even thought about pursuing a PhD at that point. And uh, I had worked with uh, Cynthia LaFond when I was at the University of Chicago and we had started to develop a model uh, that included, you know, went all the way to the bedside, but uh, you know, the PhD study kind of trumped that and, I'll have to revive that at some point, but I, but I think that's really important for, you know, recruiting uh, our, our, our younger nurses and getting them engaged, giving them exposure to nurse scientists so they can see what we do, get them engaged in projects. I think that's really important. In my presentation, you know, there were 12 years where I didn't have any access or exposure to nurse scientists for 12 years, 12 years of my career, that's half my career. Uh, so maybe had I, had access to a nurse scientist earlier in my career, would that have expedited my, my journey? Uh, maybe, I, I don't know. But it wouldn't have hurt, I, I'm sure of that. Dr. Wolf? Um, so you're all clearly um, doing beautifully and on this wonderful trajectory of success which and making important contributions. I'm wondering if there were any times that you felt vulnerable as a scientist and um, may have sort of uh, left science as a result of it or not, um, and what might have helped, or if you yourself haven't experienced that given that you're in a group of peers who are in similar situations, um, has that been something that you've noticed and has there been interventions that have been helpful uh, to yourself or others? I think uh, there are different barriers um, that stand in the way between different students. I remember being a UCLA student and um, a, a student that I knew that was in medical school had to drop out because his, uh, he had family issues, somebody died, he had to go back to work and was not able to afford medical school. And look how hard it is to get into UCLA, it's so hard. Uh, so, you know, David Geffen has given this amazing gift so that if you, if you are good enough to get into medical school, you don't have to worry um, for the tuition. Um, I, I understand that, you know, we don't have access to always that type of support, but I think you're sort of hearing and echoing that, you know, once this is a journey, this academic journey of ours, and there are periods in time where, and especially as a nurse practitioner, you know, they have a they make a good income and then, you know, you have to really cut back. I mean, I had to really think strongly, you know, I had, I had been an NP for eight years, exceeding expectations for eight years. So, you know, to, to back off to two days a week, which is what I, I, what I did so that I could fully dedicate the time that I felt I needed to be able to truly learn, uh, that was a significant hardship on my family. And uh, where, you know, my, my husband's, um, you know, in his own business. So, you know, five years before I worked for fun, but life doesn't always work like that. So I think some of the challenges um, go, go around the monies. As for being discouraged, I think, 
everyone can feel discouraged at times. And, you know, uh, being a nurse um, in uh, an academic setting where I'm not just in a school of nursing, uh, where we all look quite different, uh, can be quite intimidating. And, you know, we, being a woman scientist in particular has its own difficulties. And I sit on, uh, I sit in different leadership groups to help address some of those issues that we still face. But the fact that, you know, I'm a nurse and a woman, I feel can be sometimes, you know, a double challenge uh, because you'll have people sort of pull that card on occasion or at least try. And if you're not confident in what you do and where you came from and have good support, that that can be really intimidating in an academic setting. Lee, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I think I'm going to, um, I'm not sure that I have necessarily felt vulnerable from a scientific perspective, but I think um, just talking about kind of challenges being in the program, um, I think Margot just mentioned about um, balancing work and, you know, career and family, and that's something that for me has been um, something that I've struggled with a lot in my program. Um, I mentioned I had two babies now in my program, um, and it is, it has been for me a, a very big challenge um, with work you know, full-time in a PhD program. Um, my, uh, both my kids were in school part-time, uh, just three days a week, so I'm really trying to fit in uh, a full course load and PhD work really like during nap time, like in the evenings when the kids are in bed. Um, and uh, there have been times where I've really considered like, this is what I want, right? This is what I want. Um, you know, when I resubmitted my F31, actually, that was actually like a few months after my second daughter was born, and I rewrote my grant with my daughter, like strapped into a little baby carrier, and I was bouncing her as I was like typing up my, my grant application. Um, so I think it has been uh, challenging, um, but I think for me, um, of course, my family, my friends have been a huge support for me, my colleagues at, at, in, the, um, in the program. But again, I mentioned earlier, the university and many professors have been very supportive of trying to help me find that balance. And so I think that really has helped me get through the program. Uh, I thought it was very challenging entering academia. And sometimes I feel like I shouldn't say that because it's kind of discouraged, like you're supposed to keep that to yourself. Um, but um, it is frustrating, you know? It seems like, you know, anytime you have a, a success, almost the next day it's followed by a rejection or a major failure, right? So it, so it is kind of, um, can be challenging sometimes, but again, this is where, you know, it's really important to have a wide array of mentors, right? So I have my mentors that I go to, you know, to review my grants. I have mentors that I go to to have a cup of coffee with to say, am I doing the right thing? Should I go work in industry where I could make a lot more money? And uh, but I wouldn't be satisfied, right? I mean, that's the thing. You're 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 making a sacrifice. Um, so so I think you know the mentors are, are so important. Uh, but but you know it's a frustrating gig as we all know. But I think I'm learning, and I've been told by my mentors, and I'm believing them and trusting in them that as time goes on, you know those those uh, setbacks are fewer and fewer. And I'm starting to see that now, so. I'll just name that, um, harkening back to um, the earlier discussion, the opportunity to do this financially, be maybe because of your own family personal situation that enables that, means that we are missing out on folks who can't you know, afford it to be able to, to do this. And so it sort of both, I'm sort of, um, admire everything that you all have done, and then I think about people who are not doing it because they can't even imagine this this um, kind of financial strain. So, yeah. I, I have friends that are, have uh, similar uh, backgrounds that I have, and had the dis you said DNP or PhD, and chose the DNP route just simply because it's two years, mm -hmm. and they they went that direction simply because of logistics similar to all these different logistics that I described that you know I had to try and work out and to do that over four to five years is a long time people die people get married people I mean you know it's 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 a long time so I really think that that is a strong consideration is just the the sheer timing of it 
So we are at NINR currently. Uh, based on your previous experience, what kind of support from NINR would facilitate your career development as a nurse scientist? Great question. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I believe the question is, how can NINR help to foster our professional development? Uh, I, I have you know, given lots of different thought. We're going through some restructuring in, our, in my own institution. And so I think that uh, when I was listening to the symptom science expert um, uh, uh, proposal uh, that you have here, this program, I think that's a wonderful um, idea and uh, something that I think would be fantastic for people to be able to take advantage of. But I think it's oftentimes getting out the word. So unless like you're a program, you know, unless you're at a, a school of nursing and you've got your hand directly on, you know, a grant officer or, you know, you know, you have established a relationship with one while you were in training, they're not oftentimes, I think, even quite aware of it. I mean, I was so excited just to hear about it because now, you know, we could submit applications and, and that type of thing. But, um, and then what do you do for people that maybe can't physically get here, maybe considering translating that program and having, a, you know, bi-coastal or having centers of excellence that um, have a similar uh, program? And I, I will tell you, I'm going to really strongly think about this and have a discussion with our CNO because uh, for institutions that have capability of, of having centers of excellence, it would maybe be a really nice pairing uh, so that people don't need to travel you know, across the country and then you have to try and find somebody who's going to cover you for a month or so, six weeks where if it was local, that would break down a lot of the financial barriers. Yeah, we have one last question here in order to finish on time. Okay, you know. Um, actually, my question was kind of responded, you know, you responded to Joanne, thank you for your presentation, but it had to do with the finances of these. You have had tremendous opportunities through different mechanisms. You have paid your own way, you know, by working. You were working part time. You had, you know, other means of support. Had this not existed, you think you would be here? You would have pursued this? I would have used a different financial mechanism. So, uh, if I wasn't going to get that Dean Scholar Fellowship. Uh, Luckily, uh, Cedar sinai has um, a tuition reimbursement program. Uh, when you're talking about uh, a long program, like a PhD program, it is a, it is a one on one discussion with the CNO who decides uh, if they are going to offer you tuition reimbursement and supplementation. Uh, but in fact, I had um, had benefited from that even when I was uh, my F31 was scored. I got a good score, but you know funds were a little bit tighter that year, and I just missed the line. Uh, and uh, I, I actually got bridge funding from Cedars, paid my tuition um, for that quarter, uh, which was great. They gave me an extra five thousand dollars so I could buy a computer and just have a little, like a little bit of money extra um, to be able to you know use at my discretion and um, that really made a big difference and the stipend from the F31 was very very helpful in uh, creating a balance for me financially. I think it would have made the decision a lot harder to go back if I had to pay my own way. Um, I think I, I, I still have loans from a master's program that I'm still paying off um, so I think the idea of adding additional loans to that would be would be a huge barrier for me. Um, and so I think um, the fact that my program, you know, in the beginning of my program, before I was funded with the F, um, I worked as a teaching assistant, and so Penn supported my program in that way. Um, uh, 
I, I post program program because I was teaching. Um, and so I think that was, of course, very helpful. And then again, as I received F31, that has been very, very um, helpful in helping me really focus on my research and not need to teach. Um, but yes, for me, I think that was a big decision for my family that if I had to pay, I don't know that I, at least at that point in my career, could have gone back. Mm -hmm. So I want to thank um, the panelists um, for your sharing freely and um, um, just giving us some insight into the daily lives of what you, you experience as trainees. So thank you very much. Thank you. Hey, yeah, thank you. That was really, really interesting. And I hope we can continue the discussion after our next set of presentations. Um, which, is, which is going to be the last in this particular session on training. Um, so we're going to end with an overview and discussion of the NINR training portfolio, and that's going to be led by Dr. David Banks um, and Dr. John Grayson. Uh, David's going to start. He is the research training officer at NINR, who you all know and love. Um, he oversees the individual and institutional fellowships, as well as our mentored career awards, or most of them. Um, he holds a, many, many degrees, a Bachelor's of Science in Nursing, um, a Bachelor's in Economics, a Master's of Public Health, a Master's of Social Work, and a PhD in Human Development. His presentation is going to be followed by a presentation from Dr. John Grayson, who you heard from this morning. Um, he's the Chief of the Office of Science Policy and Legislation in the Division of Science Policy and Public Liaison. So thanks, Stephen. Outstanding. Thank you, Kathy. I really appreciate the introduction. Peace, happiness, and blessings to each and every one of you. Thank you for taking time to join us this afternoon. Again, our, our three scholars, I just can't help but ask you to give them another round of applause for <laughs> taking time out of their schedules to be here with us, and it's beautiful. I want to start with a few background things and then move right into John's presentation. Then Dr. Rasuli is going to join me here as Tara facilitates a discussion of some of these key issues that we've been talking about. NINR is involved in training and has always been involved in training. Individual awards, institutional awards, career development awards, as well as supporting the loan repayment and the diversity supplement programs of NIH. As you can see in this slide, NINR provides support wherever a nurse scientist is in their career trajectory. We have an award for them. We have a support mechanism. We have a way for individuals, regardless of their career stage, to get the scientific research training that they need to be successful contributors to the biomedical research enterprise. And we're excited about that because we pride ourselves on our ability to ensure that folks get the exposures, the skills, the experiences that they need. We are also working together, our extramural researchers and our intramural research program. Dr. Pamela Tomes, Pam, raise your hand, is over there and doing a great job seeing to it that things like the NINR Methodologies Boot Camp, the Summer Genetics Institute are available for our communities and for people to get on campus and learn a lot more about the research research that they want to do. Speaking of getting on campus, one of the more exciting programs we have is for individuals in doctoral programs to finish their academic work at their institutions and then come on the NIH campus and work on their dissertations. How fabulous would that have been when we were in school? At this point, I'd like to ask John to come forward and step us through some of the data. And then I'll come back and talk a little bit about the accomplishments that we've made and tee up our soon to be exciting discussion. John? Thanks, David. Hi again, everybody. So I just want to, um, we'll take a quick and by no means exhaustive uh, look at our training and career, and career development applications awards and then touch a little bit on outcomes. And I should note that uh, as we go forward, pay attention to the year range on some of these slides. Sometimes it'll go back and forth a little bit and it just depends on where we're getting the data from and what years were available. So as Kevin touched on this morning, uh, and this is uh, fiscal 19, about 4.5% of the NINR budget was dedicated to the support of experimental research training, the Fs and the Ts. And that places NINR second at NIH. And that's where we've been for quite a long time. And the NIH average is around 2.3%. Um, but as was pointed out, and if you pay attention specifically to the green line here, it used to be a lot more. 
Um, it used uh, back in '98, it was seven and a half percent, and it's gone down since then to around four and a half percent now. And uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of reasons for that, probably, and maybe we can touch on that a little bit later. Um, if we throw the, uh, uh, the the career development awards in there, um, that was about. Uh, then it brings our percentage up to about 7% of the budget going to both training and career development. And uh, that's and we've been pretty consistent with that um, for the past 20 or so years, um, around 3% to 2.5% of our budget have gone to K awards. So if we take a look at the T32 programs, um, the bars here are the number of T32 awards we've had in any given year and the the... The, the green line or the total number of appointments made under those awards. Um, the amount has, uh, it's fluctuated. It was a high in 2002 of about 30 awards. Last year we had 19. And as you might expect, the, uh, the, the, um, the number of positions fluctuated, you know, pretty consistently with the number of awards. Uh, to last year we had 115 of them. Now, if we just take a look at F31 applications. Now, this is the data for uh, all of NIH. So last year, uh, NIH received about, or, I don't know, 4,500 applications for F31s. And the success rate was around uh, 25%. And the, the number of applications, the dark blue bars that NIH has received over the years, has sort of trended upward over time. But if we compare that to NINR, and there's some more scatter here because uh, the numbers are smaller, um, but the thing to pay particular attention to is those dark blue bars since about the mid-2000s have been steadily decreasing. And, um, you know, again, it fluctuates a little bit um, uh, depending on the year, but the, um, uh, the number has been going down. There was a slight uptick last year, but for us, that was still relatively low. It's also worth noting that our success rate has always been relatively high for these applications, and last year it was around 50%. Um, a lot of that had to do with the fact that we didn't get a whole lot of applications. Um, if we look at the Ks, uh, this again, this is for all of NIH. Uh, we're a little bit more in line with the rest of the NIH. Again, the number of applications has steadily gone up over the years. Uh, the success rate has been relatively steady, especially for the past 10 years, around 30% or so. And if we look at um, NINR, and again, these numbers are relatively small, um, but you, there's somewhat of an increase in the number of applications over the years. And again, the success rate for NINR has always been relatively high for these, and it's around 40%, give or take 10%. And so then we also thought it would be worth looking at, so where are these awards going? And this plot here, each of those bars is, is one institution. Um, and it plots the number of both... Uh, Fs and T positions at that institution since 2000. To the left of that red line are, are 20 institutions. And the, what we find is that 86% of the trainee positions over those almost 20 years um, were at those top 20 institutions. If we look at the geographic distribution, uh, these are the F awards here. Um, uh, you know, not unexpectedly, uh, we see, you know, somewhat of a bi-coastal trend there. Um, this is over the past 18 years, this where the size of the dot indicates the, uh, the funding that went to that particular institution. Uh, the T32 awards, not a whole lot different. So then we also looked at, so what are the topics that our trainees are looking at? And in order to do this, um, we worked with the, uh, the NIH Office of Portfolio Analysis, and they have uh, some very interesting tools that they developed over the years to look at grant portfolios. 
And I'm just going to present a little bit of the data that they've given us. I'm sure there's going to be more to come uh, in the future, but I wanted uh, particularly to focus on the, the, uh, the training awards. So this slide here is uh, very simple and entirely self-explanatory. Uh, so what this is looking at is um, there is about, uh, what are the, yeah, so from fiscal 15 to 19, there were about 400,000 applications received by NIH, and that's over all mechanisms, including RPGs, F's, K awards over, that, over those five years, I guess. And so they use this software that I'm not even going to begin to explain because I don't understand it. Um, but it, it, it's able to cluster these applications into topic areas, and the lines indicate the relationships between the topics and all that kind of good stuff. But the, so the diameter of the circles here uh, shows how many applications were received on that particular topic. And the, um, the sort of the heat map element of it uh, the redder the, the dot, the more awards that were given in those, um, in those areas. And I, I should know, importantly, so the, the, the heat map element of this just shows the training awards. So if this kind of gives us an idea of where NIH is funding um, its, uh, its training awards. But more interesting to us is if we look at the same map, but now we only look at the NINR training awards, um, these are the topics where most of our training has been. And none of these are particularly surprising if we, if I can get this to work. So this red dot here is palliative care. This here is clinical best practices exercise and weight management, health education, and a few other topics uh, here and there. But really nothing I don't think that any of us wouldn't, um, wouldn't expect when it comes to our training programs, which I suppose is good because it means our, training, our trainees are, are, uh, are doing research in the areas that, that, um, that we're most interested in. Um, and then to take a little bit easier of a view at this, if I can get out of this. There we go. Uh, this just shows the top 10 topics funded by NIH and then funded by NINR according to this analysis. And again, palliative care was at the, was at the top of the list. And most of these other topics here are, are pretty much what you would expect for us. But I guess the key question going forward then when we look at these is, is there anything on that list that's missing that we're... That we're uh, that we're not supporting. And again, this is just a sample of the sort of data that we're going to be looking at going forward as we take a closer look uh, into, our, uh, into our training portfolio. And so I said I would touch briefly on the outcomes of as best as we can tell of our, of our uh, training programs, which is it's always a question of, you know, how do you define success of these programs? And um, so very briefly, um, we did a quick analysis that showed um, about one-third of the, of the people that we trained under a NURSA award between 98 and 2018 subsequently applied for an RPG. And it turns out that that number is actually uh, relatively high compared to the rest of the NIH, which was, which was great to see. Uh, in fact, um, the NIH average was across all the institutes, it was roughly about 16% or so. So that's good. 16. So I'll just, I'll, yeah, I'll let you <laughs> stew on that a little bit. Um, but the, where it's a little bit more concerning is that, um, and of those who applied for an RPG, about 40% were awarded funding, which is pretty good. It's a relatively high success rate. But that's actually low compared to... Um, others at the NIH. So, um, so that was interesting. We're not really sure how to explain that. We're going to have to take more, uh, more of a look at that as we go forward. But that's just, again, I just wanted to give you kind of a brief overview of the types of things we're, we're looking at questions? here. Sure. So that's, that's um, um, the T32, so it could be three dots, six dots, and then there's a post dot. That is correct. Okay. 
so it'd be interesting to separate out postdocs mm -hmm. um, and maybe update the years so you're not looking at that many years right. to get the idea of the trend. Yes. Um, okay, so I will turn it back over to David and then we'll, we can have a discussion. Thank you, John. Appreciate mm -hmm. that. So <clears throat> when we think about NINR, we want to show that we've taken some leadership. We're continually looking to find innovative strategies that are going to help increase the number of nurse scientists who are capable of making important contributions to our research enterprise. The first limited competition for NIH nurse scientist scholars was designed by us, by NINR, to increase the likelihood of success with an initial R01 application for those nurse scientists who'd earned a career development award. Okay, so in other words, individuals who had a K, but had not yet earned an R01, were eligible for this. It's a limited competition. We developed it. We put it on the street. There are two more rounds to go. Tell everybody you know. NIH has a way of increasing diversity within the postdoctoral pool. It's called the mosaic. We joined it. We're on it. We're ready. NIH has this advanced data analytics for behavioral sciences and social behavioral and social sciences. We're on it. We participate in those opportunities as they come up. An initial meeting of our T32 program directors was held last year. The PDs at the meeting concluded it, that the T32 mechanism is an important mechanism in terms of developing research training among nurse scientists. They actually wrote an article that's been accepted for publication in Nursing Outlook around individualized development programs, which is a, a core element of what makes the T32 successful. And so, Again, keeping with this, these are just a few of the things that we have accomplished as a staff and as an institute with your tax dollars. To take advantage of the economies of scale, NINR partnered with its sister institute, the National Institute of Allergies and Infectious Diseases, that was putting on a workshop for career development scholars to move into our series applications with as much information as possible. Over 90% of NINR's K scholars actually attended that meeting, and every single one of them either agreed or strongly agreed that this was a fantastic workshop and could be very helpful to them. As Dr. Rasuli joins me here at the staff, Dr. Schmetz is going to go ahead and facilitate our discussion period. Dr. Rasuli? And you guys can either stand up or, or join at the table, either way, whatever's more comfortable. But I just want to say that you know, training has always been a critical part of the NINR mission. And, and as you've heard, we devote, devote a large amount of resources to, to training. Um, but um, you know, we've noticed some trends, which um, John mentioned. Um, and I think we, we've started to touch on some of these issues, both in the, the discussions here today. And I know we, some of us had some conversations at lunch about uh, some of the factors that may be contributing to some of the data that we've shown. So just want to get your take on some of the data that we've uh, we've shown today. And there are a couple discussion questions up here that um, we thought could help start the conversation. So I know we dumped a lot at you, but uh, <laughs> hopefully, hopefully you have some questions. Um, you know, so I guess the, the the biggest one that has come up that was relevant from earlier today was, you know, we have this declining number of F32s, um, and F, F well, just Fs in general, actually. So yeah, so Fs, um, and so the the question is, is that as we've discussed um, a little bit today, is there a timing component that is contributing to that? And I'm I'm, I'm wondering if you guys could could talk about that a little bit. A subject near and dear to my heart, having served as the chair of the NRRC for a number of years. Um, I think Wakelin's gone, but so I think the NRRC is the group that reviews the F series yes, applications. For NI, for NI, Go NI, ahead, Dr. So, Pickler. Yeah, yeah, I love these things. So, and I teach a grant writing class at our place. So, so, and and I hope they're listening because I told them to today. <laughs> but we'll see when I get back. So I think some of what's been going on with uh, fewer pre-docs, there are a couple of things. One, we've had some really nice initiatives from foundations. The Robert Wood Johnson program, which funds, funded for three years 
um, students at a number of institutions. And so if they had that, they were pretty, pretty much fully funded. So I think there's that. Then there's the whole issue we talked about this morning about that decline we had in admissions to our PhD programs. So we, if we don't have students, they can't apply. And so I think that's a, been an issue. We're seeing an uptick, I think, in our applications now to our PhD programs, at least at our place. And I know some of our colleagues in the Midwest, there's definitely an uptick in applications last year and this year. That's good news. We'll, we'll get them back into that uh, path uh, to the F31. Um, I, I do think that our T32 programs, which is small, you know, they're, they're not that many of them, but encouraging all of those students who hold fellowships on T32s, getting them to write F applications, that's certainly a, you know, one mechanism that, that we can follow through. But I do think it has to do with the fact that we just have had limited students. We, we, you know, our pool of PhD students, are, the numbers has, have been down. And so if we, and we, and maybe, maybe individuals didn't know that these were opportunities for them. And so that's part of the message as we go out, that there are these funding things. And getting, getting um, potential PhD students writing those um, applications, perhaps as, as they're coming in the door, we're a second semester grant writing class, so that's very early. But still, I love the idea one of our panelists mentioned of getting your admitted students together in the summer before they come and really have them consolidate their ideas. We're not doing that, but, but I think I might coming up this year. So yeah, I think we just, it's a, it's a process. So I do think it's part of the whole picture of the decline in our PhD enrollment. So that's definitely part of this. I think also there's, um, in most of our PhD programs, there's a, a significant number of international students, okay, who are not eligible for these. And so when I think of like the summer program, well, they don't arrive months early. I mean, they're lucky to arrive by the first of class, okay, given all the paperwork and everything today. Um, and you don't like to have like two groups, okay. Um, so you, you can teach federal grant writing to everybody regardless of whether, I mean, just these are the real world problems we have. I know as a private school, you know, we have financial incentives to have a certain number of the students absolutely be international because they're full pay up front, okay? Um, so it helps subsidize the whole PhD program. Um, so, um, and we, we have a commitment to, you know, those students around the world as well. But I'm just, I'm just thinking it's, the reality also is kind of who's, who's in the program and how we develop these subsets of people who apply for federal and ones who don't. I, th I was wondering, just dovetailing on the F story and the international story. So the F99 KOO mechanism is available to international students is my understanding. But, um, and I know NINR is sort of connected with some of those opportunities in the past, but they haven't been the primary institution to put that mechanism out there. Is that an option? For some of those things, um, you know, there are, there are what we call, you know, the, the parent awards. And I think, um, I don't know if that one has it or not, because I, I know that one's a, a newer program. Um, David, I mean, I know you live and breathe all this stuff, so you, 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 you know, I direct this to you to answer more detail. We signed on the first year, didn't get any applications, and didn't sign on again. It might be worth uh, us reconsidering whether or not we should sign on to that. So, so was that for a particular group of folks? That was that the NINDS. It was the NCI F ninety nine. The NCI F ninety nine. Okay. Okay, but I mean, those are sort of um, 
population specific yes, and maybe not representative of all of nursing? That is correct. Okay. As I know, uh, I think they allow only one application from one institute. So uh, the nursing, uh, the students need to compete with medical students, yeah. So if your student from nursing wasn't selected as the one person from your university who could submit to that NCI proposal, the nurse didn't go in. Okay, so so um, if, if, if NINR were to have their own F99 mechanism, I could certainly see where there would be a little bit more um, traffic. <laughs> yeah. yeah. One of the things I've seen with the F31 over the years is confusion about how much they can work if they get this and they don't get a lot of money with it and it's not enough to live on. And if they could do away with those work constrictions, I think more people would be applying for it. I want to echo that, the work constrictions. Um, it forces them then to go to clinical practice every weekend so that they can make big bucks there. Um, and um, so they don't get, they don't, they're not at the feet of a, a, of a researcher uh, mentoring and working on your grant and working with it. Instead, they go to the other. And part of it is just that 10 hour um, maximum thing that they can get where they can, if they go outside academia, there's no, there's no, ma there's no minimum, maximum, maximum. <laughs> One other thing that I think has been mentioned a couple times is, um, you know, uh, getting the information out there to folks so that they understand uh, about these awards that are available, um, and even that they have the resources to be able to write um, to write grants that are are successfully. Uh, scored and funded, and I know several people have mentioned programs that they have within their own institutions to promote the grant writing. But I'm just curious about what more you think NINR could be doing to to um, you know promote awareness of some of these programs that are offered. Keep going to the regional uh, nursing societies. Uh, there's so many people I know who got inspired there and. Um, it's a very student, most of them are very student friendly and have every incentive to get students there. And um, then we try and get them linked up with program people. But so I would say keep that up in cans. American Heart, we've already had a story there uh, today. Actually, the uh, ethnic minority organizations. Uh, last year, we had Dr. Yoon at the, uh, our Asian American Nurses Association annual conference. And her uh, presentation was highly well accepted, and everybody really enjoyed it. And uh, the, all the participants are so excited about the opportunity. I just want to follow on that, too. So we go to the regionals. Um, usually we have a booth or a time to talk. Is there another venue that would be more helpful? Um, would be giving a talk? Or, or another format. And, yeah. Give uh, talks is what yeah. you did. So from people who are intramural as well as the program officers to give talks and kind of that's what would be most helpful. Uh, the two program officers came to our uh, annual conference. One was from NINR, Dr. Yoon, and the other from the NCI, Dr. Uh, April Oh. And they had uh, uh, presentations about uh, the funding opportunities at each institute, and that really inspired the participants. So it's, it's kind of the funding opportunities and ways to maybe link some of uh, our training opportunities at GPP. Though, okay. At the Western Institute, they have a specific, it's called Research and Information Exchange, and it's yeah. just for students. Yeah. And maybe even if there was an opportunity, you could sign, you know, if you, we knew a time, yeah. and you could sign up, they could sign up for some one-on-one okay. -on -one rather than just, I mean, Stopping not just. It. I think it's intimidating, because usually there's these tables, and we sit there, and I think, at least, I, I've only been there representing intramural, and so there's always these questions about what they can do and stuff like that. So the program officers seem pretty busy. I'm just seeing how we can, and I'm actually going to be at WIND. This year, so I and I think the associate deans for research kind of coordinate those, so some communication would be great. The other thing is that we have a communication staff member who gives messages out, and she has a, a table, and it's always very popular. So for ten minutes, people could sign up, and if no one signs up, you can just um, stop there. And there during post sessions and other open networking time, and she also does presentations, but uh, it's been very effective. 
And I don't know if you've done or have thought about perhaps doing some webinars around um, you know, 10 top things that work, 10 top things that don't work, you know, the real practical sorts of things. You would have to broadcast that widely. I don't know if Twitter would be the mechanism that you might use, particularly to um, reach those individuals at places that are maybe not as hooked into NINR as otherwise. So students who are out there at other institutions, so those people on the right-hand side of that, the not 20 that hold 86% of the training awards, the not 20. So how do you get to some of those individuals? Now, clearly, they have to have mentors, sponsors, whatever, who can help them with their research. But there are a lot of folks on that end that maybe we don't reach because we, they're, not, they're perhaps not at the research conferences or, or whatever. But I do think students want to know, well, what will work? What, you know, we, we, what will work? If they have good sponsors, you know, we can say that will work or whatever. But I think those are the kinds of very practical messages around the training plan itself. Maybe not so much the research plan, although some of that. But I think definitely what should you, what kinds of activities should you include in that activities table? What are reasonable goals? Yes, your sponsors help with that, but I think you guys have been around with the reviews of these and know what, what scores well, and that would be just great information for folks to have. I think there also might be, um, for T32s, um, getting the, um, I don't know if it's, and, and there's a little bit has been done about getting the directors together. But in some way, um, finding out best practices from directors, I'm thinking particularly in recruiting, because I believe the success of a T32 is recruiting talent into those slots, all right? And I'm particularly um, interested in minorities um, and getting, getting them in. And I think that there are places that have, uh, and it's not because of their location in the country that they happen to have a lot of minorities. Um, an example I will give, um, in Cleveland, I formed relationships with Hispanic-serving undergrad schools and um, historic and, and then, uh, and then uh, African-American historical. And I went there on recruitment trips and, and gave a speech and then had lunch. I told the deans, give me your best and brightest and, and recruited. And they moved to Cleveland. They moved from Florida to icy <laughs> winter, you know, sort of thing. Um, <laughs> Uh, both, uh, particularly getting those undergrad, those BSN to PhD minority to start a career. But then later on, somebody, I think it was in this group, said, I can't believe you would use your T32 money to go down and recruit them. And I said, well, I get a certain amount of money for the program, okay, that I thought was usable for that kind of um, expense of running the program, and I considered recruitment that. But my point is that that's unclear, I think about how to use those dollars um, for recruitment, and um, which I think would strengthen the programs and eventually that um, pathway to getting awarded um, when when they apply to them. Mm -hmm. So there's there's getting them together, learning some best practices, and clarifying um, some of the policies of how the money can be used, particularly for recruitment. And maybe we can. Um you know, clarify a few things on our website. And, 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 and the Office of Extramural Research within the Office of the Director here has a lot of good resources to point people to and to maybe we need to do a better job at, at doing that as well. Um, they do uh, hold, so it's a different kind of regional. Um, they do, but uh, the Office of Extramural Research holds regional meetings uh, across the country that are grant writing sessions um, and just lots of opportunity to ask questions about extramural policies, procedures, processes, whatever. Um, is that something that this group is familiar with? Um, and that I'm just wondering how much we need to promote those as well to make sure that our community is aware of some of these other resources that are available across NIH. You bring up something that was just an issue where one of my postdocs asked to go to one of the regional meetings. And I could not figure out how administrative it was 
um, of filling out a zillion forms and that sort of thing versus grant writing, all right? And so if, um, if it could be clarified, which they were, um, it would just help us understand better about um, use of our monies internally to support people to travel and spend the night and that sort of thing. Um, as I wasn't sure filling out all the clicking spots uh, on a form when if it wasn't a just in time for them would be worth the, the thing, but grant writing might have been. Sure. Well, and I encourage you to reach out to your program staff uh, here at NIH whenever you have uh, questions about that because they should be able to answer those questions or at least find the answer for you. I, don't well, know, I, I, I can just say that the regionals have tracks. So they're, they have tracks. So there's a track for administrators. There's a track for uh, people related to intellectual property, and there's a track for investigators. And the investigator <laughs> presentations focus on grant writing and on other things related to investigator success. I have folks. I'm not the only one confused by the makeup of those. So I have a question. Many years ago, I attended a council meeting where the breakdown of individuals who had been uh, on, fellows on T32s versus individuals who had F31s, what their specific grant, later grant success was. So I don't know that we have that analyzed for these data, but if not, that would be helpful from a, you know, how is it different between T, T fellows and F fellows? Um, because there was a, at that time, a quite a striking difference between the subsequent success rate on grants. And so my point is that telling that story is, is a kind of a powerful thing for those who want to be research scientists, to let them know that if they're successful with an F31, they're, they're, that's, a, that's a predictor of perhaps their subsequent success. And I think it, it does perhaps encourage people then to submit those F31s. I don't know. I mean, I've not seen IC specific data, and maybe John can elaborate on this a little bit more. But um, you know, I think sort of generally across NIH, what we see is that the folks who have um, Fs tend to have uh, better outcomes in terms of, uh, of acquiring a grant, again, presumably an R01, and that's typically what they look at when they do those analyses, uh, compared to the folks that are on the T32s. And that's just, I mean, I think what it boils down to is the simple fact that the folks that are on the Fs write their own application and they get that experience, um, guided with mentors, of course. Um, and, and I think that the T is obviously a, a great experience as well, but you sort of miss unless it's incorporated as a required part of that program to have that opportunity. So, John, is there anything that, to add? And we, we have looked at that subsequently since that analysis, and it, it's still pretty much the same. I don't have the numbers with me, but it's, it hasn't changed. Is there any anything else that um, you think would, that we that we have not talked about today regarding trainees um, that that we are missing here from the conversation? Um, because we've presented a lot of data, we've heard a lot from the trainees. Um, and I know that that's, so you want diversity of thought and you want to spread the wealth and all of that, but, um, you know, we do have limited resources in nursing and certain schools that are strong in training and do a great job of training, and our data I think shows that, um, you know, the, of the trainings coming out of particular institutions. So I wondered if that rule has ever been reconsidered or would be reconsidered or what the discussion about that. Yeah, I just learned that, um, that that was a policy in INR um, a month or so ago when we were prepping for, <laughs> for council. <laughs> as, uh, um, as you can imagine, we're all learning um, as we go along as we've transitioned into our new roles. I speak, I speak for the three of us here. Um, 
And so that's something that we'll have to look into. I mean, of course, we want to get some data um, and do some analyses behind that before making any kind of decision, though. At one question, um, when the the bubble map mm -hmm. was shown, um, and I apologize, I, I can't really read what's in those bubbles. Oh, I can't um, either. So, I'm standing you right know, here. So maybe, <laughs> maybe if it was like blown up way bigger, <laughs> I could read it, but not so Thomas much. Yes, but when you when you showed us the chart yes. and talked us through what were the top topics, I did not hear specifically, and perhaps it wasn't uh, coded for this, because I think this is from reporter, um, or maybe it's, where's symptom science? It's a good question. Yeah. And it prob my guess is it was not, that was not one of the terms that it could, it could code uh -huh. by. That's... I'm no expert on this by any means, but that would be my uh, suspicion. Well, re yeah, reporter is so much fun. Hmm. Um, <laughs> not, uh, but <laughs> it would be great if our perhaps our program officers can, could somehow look for their portfolios in the in the reporter and see what we actually have out there in these uh, various areas. Uh, in this case, particularly from our our training awards, I think that could be informative as well. Again, it helps to tell our, the, the story of the Institute. Mm -hmm. We can certainly do that. Um, I had a question just thinking about, um, and if, I, if this exists and I don't know about it, I apologize, but there's calls that come out from other institutes periodically that discuss opportunities for undergrads to be funded for research. Some of those are summer opportunities, some of those are you know, maybe year-long opportunities, but it all, to me it's always striking that uh, NINR is not part of those, and again, I could have missed some of those um, opportunities, but when we think about pathways, and we think about trying to increase, for example, um, uh, minority, individuals uh, an increase in the diversity in our training programs, we can only pick from the pool that's there. So if our BSN programs aren't promoting, um, somehow able to promote that, um, then our graduate programs aren't going to be able to promote that, and our postdocs and our faculty, you know, we, it continues right on down the line. So um, are there opportunities for NINR to have undergrad research uh, uh, funding, and, and if there could be dollars put towards, you know, increasing diversity um, as part of that. I mean, it's just something that I see come out of other institutes periodically, and nursing doesn't usually seem to be represented. Um, so there, there are those at my institution who have thought about going to some of these other places for the undergrad dollars. Um, and that seems like it would be counterintuitive given that, you know, we're, we're, you know, the support that we already have from NINR. And I just wasn't sure if that was a, a conscious decision that you made not to buy into those or you think there's better opportunities out there or why would we not be interested in a funding mechanism such as that? All good questions that I honestly don't have the historical answer to. Um, but I think that um, that you know we've heard some really really good points and suggestions here, and I'm wondering um, you know whether or not we should form a working group of our council to explore some of these issues much um, in much more detail. Um, so this would involve a couple members of council, lots of members from the or not lots. Uh, we would put some de definitions around it, but members from uh, from the extramural community. It's a common practice that you know. I don't. I don't know how 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 uh, much has been used in the NINR council, but um, wondering if there would be interest in there because I think that this would be really informative to have some um, some further uh, assessment of this from folks in the community. What do you think? It was, it was interesting. I think Jackie mentioned it when she was asked. You know, what's the reason that she wanted to go for a PhD? She mentioned her early exposure to nursing research. And I thought that was very interesting because that, you know, and I've had grants funded in which I have used undergraduates. And a lot of those, some of them became nurses 
and went on to graduate school, <coughs> but that real immersion into the, the grants and the research is what changed their trajectory. So I think, I think these are really important considerations for NI and I. Okay, well, I think we'll, I think that uh, with uh, those suggestions that you guys have made, and I think with some of the feedback we've gotten, and I think we, we, will, we will move forward with forming a working group and uh, be reaching out to maybe a couple of you guys to, to join it. So maybe some of the folks who are rotating off might have a role to play. <laughs> we may not be done with you yet. No, let's see. <laughs> <laughs> right. Remember how I mentioned how Augie retired, but we didn't actually let him retire? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, well, good. I think this, this is great. So, um, you know, we uh, next on the agenda is a break. And I, I think unless we have anything else to discuss on this topic, um, then we should go ahead and take that break. And so I'll say if we could be back at 315, um, and that way we can get started a couple minutes early with the concept discussion. Great. Thank you, guys. Thank you, John. Thank you, David. So we have one concept clearance to present to you today. Um, Dr. Rebecca Henry is going to present it to you. She is the program director for the HIV AIDS program here, portfolio here at NINR. She trained as a medical anthropologist and has 10 years of clinical and public health nursing experience. Um, and uh, I think more than 20 years of research experience as well, although that must have been overlapping because you're not that old. Um, anyway, <laughs> sorry. Dr. Henry's, uh, Dr. Henry will present um, the, the concept. It'll be fairly brief, and then Dr. Jeffrey Kelly will serve as the discussant, and then we'll open it up to council for full discussion of the concept. Okay, thank you. Um, this is going to be a super brief presentation of this concept. Um, that we have called Strengthening the Impact of Community Health Workers on Improving the HIV Care Continuum. Uh, the, concept, um, the, the Office of AIDS Research is supportive of this concept. That's the office that hands out all the HIV money for NIH-wide, all the ICs. Um, in fact, they paid for an NINR-led workshop that brought together community health workers, practitioners, and researchers last September, a two-day conference, which is available on the NIH archives um, uh, because it was videocast, if anybody's interested. So the goal, <clears throat> we are hoping to develop a program of research on community health workers' strategies uh, to improve the HIV care continuum in U.S. populations with the poorest HIV treatment outcomes. We're using a population-based, community-engaged research approach um, to test existing augmented or new community health worker strategies and programs um, in the end, the HIV epidemic locations in the country in the underserved areas. Um, so uh, the HIV care continuum is a series of steps a person with HIV takes from initial diagnosis uh, through successful treatment with HIV medications, which are uh, antiretrovirals. Um, now, successful means viral suppression of less than 200 copies detectable um, in the blood. We now know that if people are actually durably virally suppressed, they literally cannot transmit the virus. Um, so that was great news. Um, so a community health worker is a frontline public health worker who is a trusted member of and has a close understanding of the community. And basically, they function as a kind of liaison between health and social services and the and community members and they have just a very broad um, range of practice um, and the the two bullets here are taken out of an agreed upon definition that apha has has agreed to as well as the association for community health workers which uh, formed into an official organization in 2019 so um, uh, community health, like, as I said, they can take many different forms. Usually these days, it's somebody who is a paid member. So back in the 80s, I worked with community health workers at the St. Paul Health Department. They were part of our team. Um, okay, so currently there's a large gap between antiretroviral prescription and viral suppression among people living with HIV in the U.S. The causes for the lack of HIV care engagement include poverty, 
and that the illness, the HIV stigma, um, illness related stigma that is compounded by intersectional stigma, um, gender, race, class, and sexual identity. In addition, people living with HIV are more likely to have substance use disorders, untreated mental illness, and experience incarceration. So uh, we felt that, oops, that um, community health workers um, can be an effective in promoting the continuum of care um, because they have the potential to reduce stigma. Um, they can draw on their own situational experience. Often they are people living with HIV themselves. Um, and they understand and address the healthcare barriers and the so social isolation um, that people experience. So, um, the research objectives include uh, pragmatic trials of active or augmented community health worker programs that study the impact of CHWs and HIV care, um, um, I'm sorry, community health workers on HIV care and adherence. Um, implementation <laughs> research that translates and extends efficacious community health worker strategies to under-resourced communities that are hardest hit by the HIV epidemic. And um, um, all of these methods that we use are gonna involve community-based participatory methods, and that's to ensure buy-in and dissemination of the results. Um, so this program of research will provide guidance for bringing community health worker strategies to scale as a potentially significant force in solving the large gaps in the continuum of care, um, develop an effective resource for addressing HIV comorbidities and other clinical and public health problems in locations targeted by the presidential initiative to end the HIV epidemic. And at the end of the day, we hope to establish and disseminate evidence-based strategies for using community health workers to improve care engagement and HIV viral suppression in neglected communities. So now I'm gonna turn it over to um, Jeffrey Kelly. I, I think this is a really, really interesting, timely concept. I, I'm old enough, I can, I can share. Um, I remember the very early days of AIDS Maybe a few of you might. Um, when people were uh, diagnosed and they were going to die and there was no treatment that was going to work, and one of the first responses uh, to the epidemic didn't wasn't coming from researchers. It came from uh, community members uh, in uh, particularly New York, San Francisco, the cities that were hard hit earliest. And these programs were called buddy programs. Uh, sometimes they had names like Lifesaver. Uh, other kinds of programs where it was somebody who took on uh, a person diagnosed with AIDS then and helped them negotiate the different kind of things they had to negotiate. Unfortunately, it was always on a downward path. But that, that was a, an indigenous response to this kind of an epidemic. And I thought right away of that when I, when I heard about this concept. But that, that evolved into something that's gone on a, a lot longer. Um, and now, now we call them navigator programs. But the idea is kind of the same, uh, to find somebody that can help a person with HIV navigate different psychological, social, and health challenges that they're going to face. And um, the constant through all this is uh, social support, support that's coming from somebody who you know and you trust and has some investment in you. Uh, has a lot to do with uh, engaging in care, adhering to care, becoming virally suppressed, and living a long, healthy life and not transmitting HIV to anybody else. And so um, I think that, that that's been a constant. Something else that's appeared, um, really, uh, for a number of years, we've known that people with HIV usually have other things going on in their life, too, in alcohol use. Heavy alcohol use predicts poor engagement in care, lack of viral suppression. Mental health problems, uh, same thing. Other kinds of drug use, housing instability, intimate partner violence, uh, many, many of these other factors, if unaddressed, are gonna um, 
prevent someone from benefiting from all the treatment advances that are going on now. Um, I think an exciting thing about uh, this concept is uh, using community health workers as buddies, as lifesavers, as navigators. They usually come from the same community. They usually um, understand and can connect. These are people usually hired for this reason. And they're in roles when they can be enormously uh, useful. Um, Rebecca mentioned um, the End the Epidemic National Plan. And I don't know if everybody's aware of this. Yeah. It, uh, it, it was announced uh, less than a year ago. And uh, the plan is a, an ambitious one. It's to first start working in 47 or 8 counties in the country with the highest burden of HIV, as well as rural states in the south, where there are epidemics that are much more small town, rural sort of epidemics, and um, uh, drive down HIV incidents by 75% in five years, 90% in 10 years. And you wonder, well, how can, how can we do that? And there, there are four, four pillars of this plan. One is diagnosing people early with, with HIV infection, then getting them into care and getting them to adhere to care and become virally suppressed. A third is prevention, particularly focused on PrEP. And a fourth is being able to respond to outbreaks that, that emerge in a public health level. So that all sounds good. We know what to do to end AIDS. But the real trick is how do you implement? <laughs> how, do you, uh, we, uh, how do you implement these things? Because that's the, the key dimension. And I think what's interesting about the concept is it, it takes advantage of a, um, of a staffing, uh, kind of staffing professional, um, sometimes volunteers, I suspect, too, uh, community health workers uh, who are already in place in many of these cities and broadens uh, their uh, ability to meet the needs of people with HIV in order to help to implement, um, implement this uh, strategy. Um, so I think it's a, a really exciting uh, concept. We think of these, these issues as urban, and they are, but not always. Uh, you could imagine, for example, community health workers, in some cases, maybe face-to-face -face meeting with people but perhaps in rural areas, they could also be using mHealth or other kinds of distance modalities to make these same connections. And I think how this would all work would depend on you know, how the concept unfolds. But uh, it seems like a, an exciting practical way, step towards implementing uh, what, uh, what is possible to do. Thank you. Yeah. We'll open it up for discussion. I was really excited to see this concept because I, I think it's a very important concept and very needed. And I've done work with community health workers and in the area, I've also done a lot with HIV. So I wanted to add a little bit more, but Jeff, I'm really appreciative that you, you spoke about the 90, 90, 90, the 90, because I think that this, the way we could broaden this um, concept a little bit more by adding the identification of people living with HIV, because that's part of the spectrum of HIV care. So I, I would recommend promoting HIV testing whatever way. It might be self-testing. It might be going to agencies. We know that a lot of people won't go formally to agencies, so community health workers <laughs> offer the promise of promoting self-testing with the support. This is a lot of stigma still in many, many communities. And um, in some places, there might be one or two clinics to go to, and if, particularly in rural areas, so they could navigate that. So I'd like to see the concept uh, broadened. I also have an, another recommendation here. There are many different models by which community health workers are um, employed. They could be at a grassroot level where they're not in a hospital, let's say. But these models may involve different support from nurses. And I think we need to, I think I wrote it a little bit, I wrote it out to describe and evaluate the effectiveness of models for collaboration of, of community health workers with nurses and other health professionals. Because I think the outcomes might be a little different um, depending, and that's an important area to look at, as is the educational preparation, which might impact. So that might be a moderating variable on what we see in our research. Thank you. I think to add up to, uh, to what Deborah was saying, because 
in, in my research on HIV and prevention of HIV, what what you see in some communities, and I work with with underrepresented Latino, you know, communities, and like you have, uh, people like the the peer concept of having somebody from their community. However, there are limitations to that. I mean, they they don't want people to know their intimacies, and I think in this HIV epidemic, you know, and now the chronic disease of, of HIV. What we have kind of, what we're missing is, you know, we diagnose people, we counsel, we, you know, test people, we counsel them, we bring them to treatment, we put them in treatment, and then adherence kind of falls. And many times I think it has to do with, in, in certain communities, because their knowledge about their treatments, they're not knowledgeable enough, or, or people, you know, can, can really give them that background, and also because of behaviors. You know, we, we seem to do a really good job when we test them and counsel them, but then the maintenance of those behaviors throughout their, the course of their, you know, treatment, I think that's where we're kind of missing, and that's where I think the concept of supporting with healthcare provider nurses, you know, behind with a good prepared healthcare worker you know, would make a difference. Because it's not only navigate, it's beyond navigate. It's how do you support the person to maintain behavior so that they don't become, you know, reinfected and, you know, all those issues. So. Becca, you may want to respond to. But I, um, what, what strikes me about the, the model that I, I, I hear and talk about is that it's an, an enduring kind of model. We, we often uh, do things where we do some session and we do counseling and we do it very well and then we think it's going to go on forever <laughs> and, and it doesn't and so the idea that uh, that there might be health workers that are relatively permanently attached to a person um, uh, it creates real traction in the long term i think your point though about being from the same community is um you want community knowledge but other on the other hand people are concerned about people that they know too well knowing too much about them and I think how these are set up will have a lot to do with whether they'll be accepted. Yeah, and that's why we're, we're really trying to get them. They hopefully will come. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, it's interesting. Oh, yeah. So um, all of those things are things that we discussed very heavily over the last nine months. And we did decide to limit it to um, the heavy lift, which is adherence. And I thought nursing could really bring that in. The, 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 it, you know, the prevention and the, the, di, you know, the, the testing part of it, I don't want to belittle that. But I think keeping people adherent over time, and there's a lot of people in this community in particular that probably are going to need, going to go off the rails every so often, and they're going to need long-term support. And so this was really geared at trying to develop and beef up these kinds of programs that have worked in other parts of the country. Um, and um, to try to, you know, sort of embed this idea in these places that are kind of like healthcare deserts or I don't know, just they're poor, poor places with, with, you know, fragmented healthcare. And it's like, I guess to me, having worked in the developing world, I, I, I still, I just see it as, um, you know, as, as a possible strategy to deal with the what we have in front of us the world that we have so um and this is not the end of the story i mean the you know i'm hoping this is going to be just like a suite of 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 strategies that we're going to build as this um you know some money starts coming in from the end hiv epidemic which has just started to come to nih uh, one quick question and one uh, suggestion uh, my question is, are there any overlaps with the NIMHD's, uh, the community health and population health initiatives? And uh, my uh, suggestion is, could you elaborate on the linkage to the nursing science or the NINR, uh, the strategic priorities in a way? Yeah, I mean, the reason why it's NINR leading this is because it's nursing. And I mean, nurses, it's community health worker. 
So it's, it's always been the nurses and the social workers that have interfaced with these. And so that was a big thing that came up during the, um, during the um, uh, symposium as well. So, I mean, that's kind of the link and why we want to pull nurse scientists into this. And they have to have a point of reference, right? Um, so, I mean, you know, how they're embedded. Um, as far as mental health, um, Mike Sturat, their, their um, adherence guy, what did I say? Oh, MHD, that, that was Rick that was just sitting here too. They're also going to be involved, probably. So we, this has been from the very beginning, um, just because the timing was so good with the end the HIV epidemic, I had already started this a couple years ago. And, um, and it just hit at the right time. So we brought in people from you know, those other institutes, and we also brought in people from CDC and HRSA and other people to all kind of get on the same page with this. At your point, but when I read the concept paper, I was not sure uh, how the community health workers are linked to the nurses. So you may want to make it clear. Yeah. OK. Yeah, that was a good comment. And I also like the idea. I mean, that is, that is a tension between you know, knowing somebody when you know, maybe they don't want to know you in, you know, in this conversation. So um, but, but the, larger, the larger question is, what is the role of nursing in this? Because I could see, I, I know physicians that run community health program, worker programs who could apply to this, and a nurse wouldn't be anywhere in the mix of the program or the, the thought of it or it advancing nursing science. Yeah. So I you know, think about what, what is the role of nursing in this. I know it's symptom management and, and care of the, the HIV patient, but it's I, so I, narrow <laughs> with the community health worker that right. what is the role of the nurse, yeah. Yeah, except that we're testing sort of programs, and if there's going to be community health workers, they're going to be the nurses so that they interface you're with. Sure of that. Well, no, I mean, we, we called it out in the RFA, and I, you're right, and I've been thinking hard about how do we make that, um, or in the, the concept. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's social work and nursing, basically. And, you know, the way, we, the way I think about it, I, I guess I'm thinking about it in, in terms of more adherence and self-management. And I see that as not an individual responsibility, but a group responsibility. Mm -hmm. So it's the community health worker, the nurse, the social worker, all of the people are involved. It's not, you know, sort of just an individual um, person that's going to make that happen. I have a comment, question perhaps. Um, you may have seen last week the New England Journal of Medicine published the results of a randomized trial of the Camden uh, program, and it was not effective in reducing recidivism in um, individuals with chronic illness. So I only bring that up because it's an interesting, so the, so the Camden Project or program involves the use of um, community health workers and nurses and social workers to help individuals who've recently been hospitalized for a chronic condition and have gone home and trying to reduce their rehospitalization right. over 180 yeah. days. So it's yeah, an yeah. interesting report. It was in, uh, came out January 9th in the New England Journal. And if you look at the um, interventions, it, it's, it is about this sort of this same idea that connecting people to address their social concerns, which we know keep people from um, perhaps doing the things that we think they should do in order to uh, maintain wellness. Um, that those are the things that get in the way of people being able to self-manage or to follow the adherence or uh, whatever it is. And the program was not, which has been touted and adopted yeah. across the country, has not, this trial did not show that success. My point in bringing it up is read this as you are develop, further developing this concept into an RFA so that we learn from a recent study of a similar idea that might um, help inform us so that we get a good, we get good stuff to, to address this very pressing problem. The other comment I would just 
suggest is think about a cost analysis being part of these projects. Yeah, that's in there. Yes, because I didn't. Yeah. I didn't. Specifically well, I don't know what you guys what you guys actually received, and maybe, um, maybe. it keeps evolving. Yes, I understand, <laughs> but I think that is so important because the Camden program oh, it's estimates about five thousand dollars per person to keep uh, individuals from being rehospitalized. Now, that may not be a very big cost if we think about what rehospital is, but since it didn't work. It becomes a big cost. Well, I listened to that actually <laughs> with great interest in depth and listened to that guy's comments about it afterwards. And yeah. you know what they forgot? Housing. Yeah. And that's huge with yeah. this population. And we know that from yeah. a bunch of other things. I, but it was started a long time ago. I think if it had started now, that would have been yeah, so a we key can concern. Learn from all of that, right? And we, we saw some of that today from Ron Stahl's work. And so we already know with HIV, it's housing and unstable housing is critical. Right. And that's part of this whole, you know, the whole picture of hooking people to social services as well as health services. Great. So thank you. Great. Thank you. Do you have everything you need, Rebecca? Okay. <laughs> Thanks for your input. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Uh, we yes. have, I only have one more uh, quick bit of business for the open session um, today. So this is the time of year that we review the statement of understanding. It was included in your materials that were in the electronic council book and in the PDF. So I hope you had a chance to review it. Um, I, we made no substan substantive changes for 2020. So I just wanted to ask people if they had any questions about it. That's the statement of understanding. The, I didn't tell you what it was. <laughs> the statement of understanding outlines it outlines your role in the in the NINR um, council level second review council applications. Is that clear? It's about it was maybe two or three pages. <laughs> I know you all got a lot of material. So yeah, it's, people seem to have it. So yeah, it just it tells kind of what your role is in the the second level review of grants. Anyway. Anybody have any questions about it? Any concerns about it? Have we changed anything? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, the only other thing I wanted to remind you of today during the open session was that our next council meeting is May 19th and 20th. Um, additional council meetings in 2020 and 2021 are in all of your materials. Please let me know if you have any conflicts with any of those as soon as possible. That is it. So with that, I mean, we are we are actually done quite a bit early. <laughs> well, so I have a proposal for you all before I bang the gavel. Um, so we we have this room until five thirty, and I think that gets, still gives us plenty of time to get to dinner. Is there any interest in going ahead with closed session tonight, and uh, then folks could, you know, venture out tomorrow, or have the the day free to do whatever work needs to be done. Yeah, I mean, we would <laughs> we would take a little break and make sure that we clear the room and before we go into a closed session. But no materials, <laughs> notes. We should be able to access the ECB. Um, yes. Oh, 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 oh. Okay. Yeah. Now that I, that that I we can't provide you access to. <laughs> okay. Handwritten, handwritten notes. notes. Okay, so then with that in mind, because some folks might have their handwritten notes in the hotel, then um, we will adjourn for the day. But before we do, <laughs> before I bang the gavel, I just want to thank you all for uh, your excellent comments and feedback and thoughtful discussion that we had today, and to thank uh, our presenters, particularly the the. Uh, early stage investigators that uh, came here uh, and presented their a little bit about their experience. Um, and, and then, of course, thank you to the NINR staff, uh, particularly Dr. Yvonne Bryan, for uh, organizing today's meeting. So thank you all, and we'll see you shortly. There we go. <laughs> Can we get the